Darkness covers the face of the earth, and gross darkness is upon the people. Yet the Most High He shall arise, and His glory shall be seen. Ooh. You're the light of the world. A city that's set on a hill cannot be hid. So let your light shine. Men don't light a candle and put under bush, but put on a candlestick that the whole house may have light. Let your light shine before all men. That is good works they shall witness. Let your light shine before all men to glorify. To glorify our Father in heaven, shine for thy light is come, and the glory of Abba is risen upon thee. Arise, shine for thy light is come. And the glory of Abba is risen upon thee. For behold, darkness covers the face of the earth. And gross darkness is upon the people. Yet the Most High, he shall arise. And his glory shall be seen. Ooh, you're the light of the world. A city that's set on a hill cannot be hid. So let your light shine. Men don't light a candle and put under bush, but put on a candlestick that the whole house may have light. Let your light shine before all men, that his good works they shall witness. Let your light shine before all men to glorify. To glorify our Father in heaven. Shine, Israel. Shalom. Shalom. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Greetings, peace, and blessings. Shalom. Shalom to all the Hebrew camps, congregation, Knesset, the nations, the Nethanims. Speaking of the Nethanims, we have special guests in the house. 
adhering to the scriptures of the Most High to come to the children of Israel and bring forth their tithe so that a blessing may be upon them, their nation, and the world as a whole. Let's salute the Most High and give him a hand of applause for bringing in the nations. Absolutely. And to all my Hebrew brothers near and far and scattered abroad, I got a message for the Hebrew camps, all the Israelites that are in exile, that the Heavenly Father is preparing a great and grand exodus. God. The Heavenly Father is preparing to take the saints home as prophesied. So don't get comfortable. Arise, shine, for this is not your rest. The Heavenly Father has a place for us, and it is the place of our nativity, the place where we were in the beginning. Hmm. These are the places of our diaspora, the places of servitude and captivity. But we have been here so long that we actually think these places are our home. We are sadly mistaken. And for those who have been screaming, those who have been crying out to the Heavenly Father for change, or what Ezekiel said, sighing and crying for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. He said, go and put a mark in the forehead, a sign of the covenant of every one of them. If you've ever gone outside and you've seen our brothers and sisters looking simple, acting stupid, if you've seen churches or camps or whatever it may be and you just disgruntled about it, the Heavenly Father has you that way. That's a special gift. He's getting ready to bring you to the place of your nativity where we were in the beginning. We have the calendrical study guide in hand. The waiting is over. Those who have been patient, adhering to the scripture, and patience possess your soul. All praises to the Heavenly Father. I'm going to give you a little backstory before we actually start talking about the Calendrical Study Guide. We actually had the Calendrical Study Guide ready, finished, done. Months before the new year. We was all ready to go. We was ready, was getting ready to send it to the printer. And the Most High said, hold up, in a vision, and gave us some depth, some understanding that we would be remiss not to bag it back up and begin to put these things in it so that we don't wait for the next year to bring because it might not be a next year here. Um. This is the importance of it. So we had the calendar based on the moon. And what do we mean? There's a lot of brothers and sisters don't understand the moon. And they're still using the moon to quantify time. They're going outside seeing a crescent, a full, or whatever. And so in that, we came up with an almanac. We came up with a moon chart a calendar that talks about the regression of the moon and all of that. It's just chock full of information. But the father said, wait, there's more. Mm -mm. I have more to give you that appertain to you right now. And that calendrical study guide that we have right now, the title of it is The City of Adam. If we'll bring up the picture of the study guide, it is The City of Adam. Not The City of David. The city of David was a consequence to things that happened uh, in the city of Adam. In the city of Adam, the Heavenly Father brought up Adam and Eve. They had two sons, Cain and Abel. Cain murdered Abel, and the Father replaced him with Seth. And Seth was one of ten mighty kings that reigned on top of a holy mountain or a holy area called the city of Adam. And because of recidivist backsliding behavior, the Most High brought a flood and began to destroy that city. Now, Noah being preserved in a boat, him and his son and their wives, the Most High began to ferry them away, way away from the city of Adam, and they landed on Mount Ararat. And they began to descend that holy mountain. And they began to populate Mesopotamia, Sumer, uh, the Akkadians. And then we know that the Egyptians came around, the Assyrians, Neo-Babylon, Society began at that point, but now we have digital copies, as we just showed, and we also have the hard copies, if you'll show the hard copy that we have, but the calendars are here. This calendar is chock full of information, worth more than gold. The scripture said, buy the truth and sell it not, because these are the uh, fundamentals of your personal salvation with the Heavenly Father. Not that this is gonna save you, the information in there is for you to adhere to. And so we're talking about the city of Adam for a purpose. The Most High has never given us anything to sit back and just look at in awe. Wow, we know about that seventh covenant, but I ain't going to enter into it. Oh, we know about oblations, but I'm not going to give them. Oh, we know about the Ten Commandments, but I'm not going to hear That's not how the Most High works. He give you a thing, see what you do, then he give you another one. 
Then he gives you another. But the day you begin to sit on it and say, I know about baptism, but I'm not going to do it, you mm. will get nothing else until you do that. Same here. The Most High has given us the city of Adam for a reason. Not for us to sit back and say, that show is nice. <laughs> the Most High want us to make a move. Hallelujah. And the move we will make. And those that are in the covenant have already been preparing for it. We're talking about an actual location here on earth. Right here on earth. And that's what the subject of the class is today. Is about the fall, the rise and fall of Adam. And when he fell, he was actually placed in a physical, geographical location. And all the theologians are dumbfounded. Mm. Ask them where the Garden of Eden is. It's, it's, it's in uh, Iraq. Mm. Oh, yeah, it's, it's somewhere in Turkey. It's, it's somewhere. They don't know. But we know. And what we know from the Heavenly Father, you now know. For it is our job to actually give it to the saints and so that the saints may begin to utilize it in their day. And so now the Most High in the end of the sixth millennium is fulfilling prophecy like never before. We've been talking about the 6,000 years plus the seventh and how at the end of 6,000 years there shall be this metaphorical and physical change of the saints, a spiritual and physical change. And the Most High is going to begin to raise them up in the sixth millennium like he raised Adam up in the sixth age or the sixth day to some. And this is part and parcel of it all. So we're going to get into the intro. We're going to get into the class, which is talking about some of the peripheral things of that, um, that calendar. All right, we're going to get into Genesis 1 and verse 3. We're going to start again at the beginning. We've been talking about in this series the Feast of Weeks, the Feast of Pentecost, the Feast of Harvest. We've been talking about how it is reflective of the seven ages of creation. And so there are seven weeks or 50 days in the Feast of Weeks, just like there were seven ages in Genesis. And every week you are to focus on what was happening in creation. These are the things that the Heavenly Father is doing to the saints in the latter days. And so when we understand Genesis, we can further and more accurately understand the Feast, feast of Weeks or Pentecost. Let's start at Genesis 1 verse 3 and we're going to quickly go through it in this intro so that we can get to the more salient points of the class. And the Most High said, let there be light. So we have here in that first age, the Most High creating Elohim, the angels, and he's creating the light. We talked about what this light was in the very first of this week of these weeks or the feast of weeks we talked about it being an instruction manual for the elohim this wasn't a physical light shining from some bulb or the sun or the moon that didn't come about to the fourth age and so what is this light it is enlightenment the most high essentially wrote a book and said in the second phase i want you to bring forth this water and in the third, make vegetation so that the sacrifices can be done because the baptism will be done in the second. And in the fourth, codify time and instructions on when to worship. So the Elohim, the angelic Godhead, was like, okay, we can do that. He had just created them for that purpose. When you read Genesis 1, it's almost like the Most High is down here in earth with a shovel building the earth himself. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. As if he's down with brick and mortar and he's like, whoo, boy, it's a lot of work down there. <laughs> the Most High did no such thing. The Most High created the workers. It's just like a building being built. You know, you see one of these skyscrapers and whatnot. Who built it? The architect and the financiers. These guys laid not one brick. They didn't put any kind of sheetrock on the wall, but they go around with the bragging rights saying, I built that building. And the guy who was doing electricity or plumbing or whatever, they was a part of it. Think of them as the Elohim. Mm -hmm. But the Most High is the architect. We are the archetype. All right, let's read on. And there was light. All right, we're going to skip there. That's the first phase or age. Remember that term day come from the Hebrew yum, which means age. And a lot of people confuse it with day and they think that the earth was made in one day. That's not it. That's not the case whatsoever. The Heavenly Father was utilizing the lots, creating them in an age, undetermined amount of time there. All right, we're gonna move over to the sixth verse now. And the heavenly father said, let there be a firmament 
in the midst of the waters. So in that book of light information, the Most High told the Elohim, create first water. Why? I want them to baptize. I want them to cleanse themselves before they come unto me. And it is so this very day. This very day, before you go and worship the Heavenly Father, you must wash your hands or your feet. Some people think that a baptism is submerged. I was baptized when I was six months old. I'm 46 now, and I never touched it again. To a saint, you're pretty much saying, I have taken a bath when I was six months, and for 40-some years, I ain't never took a bath again. That's not impressive. You wash yourself every time you come and worship Abba. This was the ancient ways. This is the day. This is the way of today as well. So the Most High in the second phase created water. What did he do in the third? Let's jump down to the 11th verse. And all of this was covered in this series. Anybody want any kind of specificities on it? Go back and listen to the classes. Yara Dunn did an excellent job of pulling out this information. Let's read. And Abba said, let the earth bring forth grass and the herb yielding seed. So the Most High said, let every herb bearing seed be your meat offering. Sorry to disappoint the vegans and the vegetarians who thought that this was a plug to be vegan. This is not what he's talking about. Your lifestyle is great, it's wonderful, but it's not a mandate from the Heavenly Father. Every herb bearing seed is not your steak. Hmm. This is an old English term that means grain. Let every herb bearing seed be your grain offering to the Most High is what he was telling Adam. And so no offering can be GMO. And if no offering was genetically modified, being seedless grapes or seedless water watermelon, we couldn't eat it. All right? We had to eat the seed, the herbs bearing seed. So that's what happened in the third day. Why? The Most High said, let man, who was created, bring forth his sacrifices. He got the baptism. Now let him bring the grain sacrifice. Now let's move over to the 14th verse. And Abba said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night. Now these lights, again, is different from that light of the first day. The father's not being redundant, nor is he contradicting himself. If you go back to the Hebrew, we now can see the specific differences. This is talking about time. This is talking about putting forth a schedule of when to offer the grain offering to the heavenly father. When do you do it? You do it every day, morning and evening twice on the Shabbat and high holy days that he's going to bring forth, whether it's the Day of Atonement on the summer or the winter, the new months, whether it's the uh, Feast of Tabernacle, Feast of Unleavened Bread, Feast of Passover, any one of the high holy days that the Heavenly Father put forth. In this fourth day, he was now saying a specific time to come. He's bringing forth our calendrical study guide, so to speak. And all of this was already written in the first day. The angels, the Godhead, is just implementing it, creating it. And the Most High looks at it and says, that's good. Excellent. Now go build the next thing I told you to build. All right, we're going to leave there and move over to the 20th verse, which is essentially the subject material of the class today. We're going to pick it up in the 5th age, the 6th age, and we're going to end it with the 7th age. Let's read the 5th age. And Abba said... Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creatures that have life and the fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. And Abba created great whales and every living creature that moveth, which the waters bringeth forth abundantly. All right. So we went through this. Um, priest Yeridan and Priest Azaria talking about in the fifth phase, the Most High brought forth the animal sacrifice. It was the things from the water with fins and scales, and then eventually the things from the land that uh, he approved to be an acceptable sacrifice. These things the Heavenly Father ordained from the beginning because it is pleasing to him. We may turn around and say, I don't like it. It doesn't matter what you like. God. It's what the Most High requires. And here's the beautiful thing. The Most High is creating all of this for his good pleasure, worship. But we have taken it and said, no, this, this world is about us. Hmm. My white house with picket fence and 2.3 children and my job and me, 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 me. And we don't understand the Heavenly Father. And we are lost in darkness. It's a term for that. When the children of Israel 
failed or abdicated their responsibility to worship the Heavenly Father, Jeremiah looked and said, I saw the world and it was void mm. and it had no purpose and it was formless. And so that's what happens and that's where we are today. The world is in utter darkness. There's no worship to the Heavenly Father appropriately, properly, as it says in Romans 10. They have a zeal for the Heavenly Father, but not according to knowledge. They're not utilizing the water appropriately. They're not utilizing the vegetation appropriately. They're not utilizing the sun, moon, and the stars appropriately. Neither are they coming together with the right offerings unto Abba. We're going to stop right there, and we're going to, uh, actually, if you would, if you would talk about where they can get the calendar before we actually end this intro so we can pick up the class. Con, as uh, Sister Brianna is going to bring through in the announcements, uh, and as Chief Priest talked about earlier, we have the 2022 through 2023 Calendrical Study Guides here available in-house, printed copies and digital copies. You can go to our website and get those at shekinai.com slash calendar. However, uh, keep in mind, uh, we announced this earlier to the members of the congregation, and they were all anticipating, and they flocked to our website to get it. And they actually crashed the website. <laughs> so much data oh and everything God. going forth. Everybody was trying to get their calendars and the clinical study guides. The website actually shut down because it couldn't handle the traffic going to it. So, um, yeah, you definitely want to get one of these clinical study guides before they're all gone. So, uh, most I will, and the website will be up very soon. Again, once again, that's shekinai.com slash calendar. The uh, link to that is in the description of this video. Uh, definitely go ahead and grab those uh, when you can. Obviously, there's unlimited digital versions, uh, only so many physical versions. And we talk about this great city of Adam and how the saints are going to return, when to come and worship the Heavenly Father in that city. So you definitely need one of these calendrical study guides. But once again, that's shekinah.com slash calendar. And those who like to collect our calendars and maybe have not been here for years and years and years, obviously we have this year's, all right, talking about based on the city of Adam. But we also have last year's, we have a few remaining, those who are just looking to collect it based on the tree of life. But we also have a third one talking about the night watch. This was three years ago. Hmm. All right, and those who are really looking to collect <laughs> we had four years ago. Limited, limited. Look how, look how basic it was. Right? Yeah. But it was hot back then. See, that we could do <laughs> and get it out in the new year. That's Absolutely. just 12 pages. Exactly, 12 pages. It started to grow. This we, can new... get, we can give you the next 10 years if you want it. It's that All simple. Right. All right. This calendrical study guy, you can see the difference. This thing is about 120 pages nearly. Con, so. con. So we have limited, especially the old one, very limited. And then uh, last, uh, well, three years ago, obviously, um, we have a few. And we'll probably list how many we got. But if those who are looking to collect, uh, definitely get your hands on it. We're going to now bring in Sister Brianna with the announcements. All right, Shalom family, and welcome to the 20th day of the fifth month of Shemut, a blessed win in the constellation of Asher. And welcome to the 50th day of the Feast of Weeks. I am Sister Brianna with your announcements for today. It's good to see everybody's face today, and if you're joining us online, welcome. Um, hopefully everybody was able to accrue as much virtue as possible for this 50th day. And as we prepare an acceptable meat offering to the Most High, let us continue to gather our tithes. Speaking of tithes, make sure to visit shekinaya.com slash tithe and there you'll be able to purchase any of the oblation bread flour mix, wine or non-alcoholic wine, olive oil, salt, or incense. Um, these can be obtained for your own personal use or for the priest to use. And you can also make a free will offering by visiting shekinaya.com slash donate. Um, again, as we mentioned in last week's announcements, items we're no longer accepting um, this olive oil, or another example would be this flower. Everything that you need will be able to be located on the website, so you'll want to make sure to visit that as soon as possible. Hallelujah. As mentioned, the wait for the, the biblical calendrical study guide is over. We do thank everyone for their patience, and thank you for those who filled out the interest form online. Um, at this time, both the physical and the digital calendar is available. I'll be willing that website will be back up and running any moment, so you'll be able to visit shekinah.com slash calendar 
or you can also find the High Holy Day and Memorial Day charts um, on that website as well at shekinai.com slash high holy day. We do hope you all will join us for the classes that are held outside of the Shabbat class every week. Those classes do include Daughters of Wisdom. That meets um, every so-called Sunday at 9 a.m. Um, Bible study does meet every so-called Wednesday at 7 p.m. And the Unity class, which is United Nations and the Tabernacles of Yahweh Shai, that's the class that meets every Sunday at 9 a.m. as well. For details on how to obtain access to any of the classes mentioned, make sure to visit shekinaiah.com slash membership. House of Wisdom's health and wellness line, Living Waters, is also made readily available to everyone here. To obtain any form of the temple blend, as you'll see to my right, um, you can visit shekinaiah.com slash health. Um, and as mentioned previously, the double onyx will be available for purchase again at or during the winter season. Any questions, comments, or inquiries that you may have, make sure to contact our correspondence team at houseofwisdom at shekinaya.com. And as a final reminder, any of the links that have been shared within these announcements today can be found in the description of this live video, which you will want to make sure to like, share, and subscribe to our page. And this does conclude the announcements for today. Please turn your attention back to Chief Priest Banyala, who will be bringing forth today's message. May the peace offerings be multiplied unto you all. Shalom. Shalom. You are in search of the truth, and may the truth of the Most High make you free. Let's start the class. Again, welcome to the House of Wisdom. Welcome to the Feast of Ingathering, also called Pentecost, or the Feast of Weeks of the Most High. We are today, right now, live in the 50th day. And those who are familiar with Pentecost, you may remember in Acts, the second chapter, where the apostles were told by the Messiah, the Prince, go and wait for the 50th day. Mm -hmm. The Most High is going to send down what you need to communicate the gospel. And that's what this day is about. It's not about you know, getting money and, you know, whatever, whatever, whatever carnal thing you may think of. It is about how well can I communicate the gospel to the saints of the Most High that are in need of it. They had the gospel. They had the Seventh Covenant, but they didn't speak uh, the Italian language or they didn't speak any of the language that the children of Israel was dispersed into. And so the Most High gave them something that we would have never thought of. If we were placed in that exact same situation, I'll be like, yo, anybody speak Spanish? Speak Spanish? Anybody? Okay, we're going to get you to talk to the Spanish brothers. That's the earthly way I would have done it. 
I would have never thought in a million years that I'm just going to speak. And that strange language that only 12 people on the earth speak, you're going to hear it clearly? In every language on the planet earth, that's the kind of power that the Most High is bringing forth in this 50th day. It is about communicating the gospel of freedom and liberation to those who are held captive to sin and trespasses. The Most High is blessing us and blessing us indeed. And to uniquely have the city of Adam, its coordinates, its geographical location given unto us, and a message to go and return home, it's utterly, completely amazing. It is time for us to return home. But as I said before to many brethren and sisters, it's not enough just to go there and say, Lord Jesus, I'm here home. Open the door. Lightning may come and strike you. You may be like a Jehovah Witness knocking on the door. You know how that is. You like, get up out of here. You may be annoying the Most High. That is the place of his abode. It says he lived in the heavens above it. We're going to talk about that today. So when you do go, what do you do? You do what Adam did. You do what Seth did. Do what Enos and Enoch and Lamech and Noah did. They lay prostrate at time. And they oblated to the Heavenly Father. They said that they wanted to do nothing else but doxologies, worship, and praise the Most High, singing psalms unto him. You know how in the world they have the Christmas carols, the people outside singing, you know, you're like, oh, whoa, what a beautiful thing. <laughs> the Most High want us in righteousness to do these things. And we're going to talk about it today, Abba willing. Let's go back to the fifth age of creation. We can't talk about the rise and fall of Adam if we don't start in the fifth day. Adam obviously was created in the sixth phase or age why did we go to the fifth because his downfall started before he even showed up on the scene hmm. and it's like that for you and i as well the forces that are against you and i have been on this earth before we was even conceived or born on the earth they have been here they have been steeping waiting on your return to try to kill and abort you before you're hmm. even born God. But they have not been successful. And all their extra efforts and cheating and all of that, the Most High has just circumvented it. You can't outwit, outsmart, mm. outmaneuver the Most High. Right. We have to give ourselves to him, for he is the master of it all. He is the author of it all. And if he wrote in this book at the very end, despite all the tribulations and all the uh, hard comings they achieved, then we will achieve. As simple as that. All right, let's go back to where we were in Genesis 1.20. And executive priest, you are done. If you'll give me 2 Ezra, Apocrypha 6.47. And Abba said that the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creatures that hath life and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of the heavens. And Abba created whales, great whales, and every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly every after their kind and every winged fowl after his kind and Abba saw that it was good and Abba blessed him and said be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the seas and let the fowls multiply in the earth and the evening and the morning were the fifth day recap in the intro the very first age was light or information on what to do for the next six days and for the second age the most high brought forth the water so that all the saints can baptize baptized in heaven and in earth the third he brought forth the vegetation for a grain offering also known as a meat offering to the most high and in the fourth age he brought forth the construct in the time to when where to sacrifice to the heavenly father now in the fifth age he brought forth this sacrifice of the animals all right that were created for that very purpose wing files and things of the ocean and we went through that Yerry Dunn and Priest Azaria showed that Leviticus 11 and Deuteronomy 14 is not a dietary law. It's not that when you eat clean fish, you're just super healthy. You can eat a lot of lamb and you can still catch, you know, plaque in your arteries. Mm -hmm. You still have a heart attack. Same thing with the fish and all of that. And so the Most High is not saying that this is healthy. He's actually saying that this is acceptable. This is acceptable. And so those were the laws, Torah, of acceptable sacrifices to the Heavenly Father. Now in that fifth age, those of you who think Genesis is specific in detail, let's move over to 2 Ezra 
Genesis or the Bible in general is like a picture. And if you take a picture of that picture, it gets a little bit more grainy. And then if you take a picture of the picture, and then a picture of the picture, 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 and then a thousand years later, it just looks like a big blur. What's that? <laughs> I don't know. And that's exactly how it is. When you find out in the Masoretic text that came around by these Masoretes, so to speak, in the seventh century, these were Hebrews with the Berbers and with the Ottomans. They began to codify, unify, and bring the Torah back together because it was going all over the place. It wasn't the Torah, but it was the books of the Most High. And so they were beginning to see things, you know, move away from its intended purposes. And so you begin to see that the early Hebrews knew more than the latter Hebrews. Or I say the early saints knew more than the latter saints. And so let's look at what Ezra knew about the fifth age. Genesis 1, I mean Exodus, Ezra, 2nd Ezra 647. Upon the fifth day, thou saidest unto the seventh part, where the waters were gathered, that it should bring forth living creatures, fowls and fishes, and so it came to pass. For the dumb waters, and without life, brought forth living things at the commandment of Abba. That all people might praise thy wondrous works. So the water that had no life brought forth life. Letting you know that the Most High was creating something from nothing. The Most High didn't go to Mars and go borrow some minerals to create Earth. He didn't go to another part of a universe and say, let me borrow, you know, some, you know, cadmium or something. It didn't happen like that. Out of nothing came something. This is the power of our Abba. Let's read on. Verse 49. Then didst thou ordain two living creatures. As we read in Genesis, this was not there. The Most High ordained two living creatures of authority. And what were they titled? The one thou callest Enoch. Also known as Bohemoth. He called him Bohemoth. We'll get into it a little bit more. Read on. And the other, Leviathan. You may have heard these names before. The Most High created Bohemoth and Leviathan on the fifth day. And what was their charge? Let's read. Verse 50. And did it separate the one from the other? For the seventh part, namely where the water was gathered together, might not hold them both. Unto Enoch thou gavest one part, which was dried up the third day. All right, so one had authority over the waters to make sure that all the clean fish would populate, procreate, and be in abundance for the sacrifice. And the other had authority over the land to make sure that all clean animals were always in rotation, always well kept, well taken care of. The Most High had two angels in authority. Let's read on. Verse 51 again. Unto Enoch thou gavest one part, which was dried up the third day, that he should dwell in the same part wherein are all are a thousand hills. But unto Leviathan thou gavest the seventh part, namely the moist, and has kept him to be devoured of whom thou wilt. All win. right, so the Most High is saying here through Ezra that he created these two beings, sapient beings, to control the land and the earth. Now, some may say, I don't believe in the Apocrypha. That's okay. All right, too bad for you. But we're going to prove it further in Job, the 40th chapter, in the 15th verse, that these two creatures existed. And so if you just read Job alone, you wouldn't know where Behemoth or Leviathan even came from. It's just out of the blue. Jobab or Job just talked about it. But we're going to read it with some context as well. Job 40, verse 15. Behold now, Behemoth, which I made with thee, he eateth grass as an ox. Lo now, his strength is in his loins, and his force is... In, uh, is in his navel or in the navel of his belly he moveth his tail like a cedar so he's not talking about an actual creature he's speaking in as an idiom so or a parable parabolically saying that he's over all the beasts of the earth this is an angel as we'll prove in a moment this is an angel over the animals of the earth let's jump down to the 19th verse for time's sake got a lot to cover he is the chief of the ways of the heavenly father. So he was a chieftain over all the creatures of the earth. It was his job to make sure no animal went extinct. If an animal did go extinct, let's say the ivory-billed woodpecker just 
depleted off the earth, the most high would call behemoth. Come here, come here. Didn't I tell you to keep them things going? And he would have to pay. This would be a breach of his contract with the Heavenly Father. So they were adamant about making sure that no animal was extinct whatsoever. Let's read on. He that made him can make his sword to approach unto him. It is the Most High that can chastise or check him. Nobody else has that authority. It is the Most High, once again, to say, the buffalo is going to extinct. He can't say, well, the Europeans overhunted them. Yeah, I don't want to hear that. Then go spank them. Make sure that my buffalo appears, especially buffalo. That's a clean animal. Con. We may need it for a sacrifice in that time. All right, we're going to jump over to Job, the 41st chapter, and we're going to pick it up in the very first verse. Canst thou draw out Leviathan? So the 40th chapter is talking about Bohemoth or Enoch. Nothing to do with the seventh from Adam. It's talking about Bohemoth that was created on the fifth day. Can thou draw out Leviathan with a hook? Because he's in the waters. Do you have that authority? Most High is bragging or boasting to Job. Read on. Or his tongue with a cord which thou uh, lettest down. All right. Jump down to the fourth verse. Will he make a covenant with thee? This is a thing. Remember that. We're going to come back to that. Can you make a covenant with Leviathan? You got a covenant with the Most High. Can you make a covenant with Leviathan? Jump down to the last, or 34th verse. Uh, he beholdeth all high, uh, all high things. He is a king over all the children of pride. So we have Bohemoth and Leviathan being kings over the children of pride or wickedness. All right, let's keep that on our frontal lobe as we begin to dismantle these scriptures. We're going to go to the book of Enoch. Once again, if you don't believe in Enoch, too bad for you. You just literally tied your hand behind your back and said, I want to fight with no hands. We need as many valid venerated holy books are the most high as possible and if you only rely on the 66 once again too bad for you the most High said clearly on many occasions that he had 200 plus books that came mm -hmm. through uh esdras all right he just just brought them back on the earth and there's many many more you have to be skilled enough to go in and say that this is bunk this is trash but this is valid and enoch is valid a thousand times over a thousand times over. This is how we get this accurate calendar of the Most High. And I challenge again, in righteousness, anybody to put forth a calendar only using the 66. It ain't going to happen. It's not going to happen. You're not going to know. You're going to do a lot of speculating, uh, inserting uh, things, and, you know, you're going to do a lot of just, just creativity. But this Enoch is hard evidence proof of what the will of the most high is that was created on the fourth cycle or fourth age all right we're going to go to enoch the book of enoch the 60th chapter the fragments of the book of noah and we're going to read it some people say before i go on just a little footnote that this book i've heard this they've uh put forth and postulated that uh this book is not valid because noah wasn't alive when enoch was there all right and these things are true this book is not saying that he was alive with uh, Enoch. This is like saying that uh, the New Testament or New Covenant is not valid because when the Messiah was transfigured, Moses wasn't during that time, nor was <laughs> Elijah. They weren't there at that time. So it says that he met Moses and Elijah. That's all garbage. You can't say that. All right. He saw him in a vision. Let's get back to the more salient points here. Start at the first verse. Seven verse. Like and if you'll give me the book of Adam, for those who don't have the book of Adam, this is not the first or the second book of Adam and Eve. This is another testament of Adam. It's called simply the book of Adam. It's a pseudepigraphal book that they named, but it's a valid book. We're going to be in that as well. We're going to be in that uh, chapter called the fall of Hasatan or fall of Satan. All right, let's get it. Enoch 60 and 7. Con. And all that day where two monsters parted. Now, Enoch is talking about Leviathan again. He's talking about Bohemoth again. He's talking about the fifth day. Let's be careful. Let's understand what was happening. Let's not be afraid of it. Let's read. A female monster Meaning named... Meaning a submissive one, not gendered. One was over the area where man did not dwell, in the ocean. We don't dwell there. We may pass through it, 
but nobody lives in the ocean. Let's read on. Um, the female monster named Leviathan to dwell in the abyss of the ocean over the fountains of the waters. But the male he named Bohemoth. Who All right, the more masculine or authoritative one, he called Bohemoth to put over the land. He's going to be more active with men. All right, he plays a greater part in this. Let's read. Who occupied with his breast a waste wilderness named du 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 Dudian Khan. Um, on the east of the garden where the elect and righteous dwell, where my grandfather was taken up the seventh from Adam, the first man who the heavenly father of spirits created. And I besought the other angels that he should show me the might of those monsters, how they were parted on one day and cast, the one into the abyss of the sea and the other unto dry land of the wilderness. So Enoch said, I sought to know the understanding of Bohemoth and Leviathan. I want to know what are their purposes. Let's read. The 10th verse. And he said unto me, thou son of man, herein thou doest seek to know what is hidden. Ah, you seek to know what is hidden. This is why you don't know about Leviathan or Behemoth today, because that esoteric, deep, hidden meaning is just that. It's taken away. And very few people know, but today, Abba willing, you will know the truth. And it will empower us because we will see the fall of Adam. But we'll also see the rise of him as well. And like Adam, we too will rise because it was prophesied his descendants will do the same. We're going to move over to the book of Adam. The chapter, the fall of Hasatan, the fall of Satan. And those who don't have a physical copy, obviously you can get a PDF online. There are sites, websites to have it. These books are old. So, you know, no copyright problems or issues there whatsoever. Let's read it. Starting at the top. Con. Or the 12, 12 one? Con. Con. The book of Adam, the fall of Satan. 12.1. The devil began to cry with forced tears, and the devil told Adam, O oh Adam, all the greed and anger and all the grief of my heart are directed against you, because it was through you that I fell from my dwelling. It was by you that I was alienated from my own throne. My wings were more numerous than those of the cherubim, and I concealed myself under them because of you. Now my feet walk on the earth, which I would never have believed. Now, we're going very, very fast here. We covered the fifth, but we also now covering the sixth age where Adam was made. But we also looking at the end of the sixth when he failed. All right, we're seeing Hasatan telling Adam, I hate you. Mm. You'll find out Adam is saying, I didn't do anything to you. Satan is saying, I don't care. I hate you. You are the reason I fell. Mm. And there will be animosity between you and I, your offsprings and I, until the day of the end. There's a reason he's so ambivalent, so hell-bent against us, and we'll see it today. Let's read. And Adam replied to the devil and told him, What is my fault? By which have I done all that to you? The devil replied to him and told him, You did nothing to me, but it's because of you that I have fallen upon the earth. The very day when you were created, on that day, I fell from before the face of Abba. Because when Abba breathed a spirit unto your face, you had the image and likeness of the divinity. And then Michael came, he presented you and made you bend down before Abba. And Abba told Michael, I have created Adam according to my image and my divinity. So Satan is turning around and saying the Elohim, which we're going to cover today, Abba willing. The Elohim that you created, the angelic Godhead, finished everything and told everything from day one all the way to day six to bow down. All right, even you, Adam, turn around and bow down to the Most High, the Creator of everything. Let's read on. 14.1. Then Michael came. He summoned all the troops of angels and told them, Bow down before the likeness and the image of the divinity. And then, when Michael summoned them, and all had bowed down to you, he summoned me also. Now, 
we have Satan saying, when the Most High said, all bow, I bowed. This is Satan. Hmm. Or the Satans. He said, I have no problem with worshiping the Most High. So let's extract it. Let's exhume it out of our mind that Satan is a rogue angel going hmm. around trying to ambush and sneak attacks on the Most High. He does not fight against the Heavenly Father. Let's read on. 14.3. Or 14.2. And then Michael summoned them and all bowed down to you. He summoned me also. Now he turned around and say, bow down everything that was created to Adam, mm -mm. who was to control, govern, and rule everything from the first to the sixth of creation. Bow down to him. Let's read. 14.3. And I told him, Go away from me. This is what Satan said to Michael, an angel of the Most High. Yo, bounce, man. Get out of my face with that. Exactly. Get out of my face with that. You talking about bow down to Adam. Are you crazy? <laughs> you got me Why? messed up. Yeah, you got me twisted. I'm, I'm a strong angel. Why? For I shall not bow down to him who is younger than me. Mm -mm. He is younger than me. Ah, so if Adam was made on the sixth, when was Hasatan made? On the fifth, absolutely. This is the confederacy of Bohemoth and Leviathan. These were the angels that was given charge over the land and the waters that's supposed to bring forth things to sacrifice. They became pompous and proud and was like, wow, we're over all of this? The most I've made us special. All right, give me a pound, give me a pound. They over here fist bumping and all of that. It was like, we are about to rule. And on the sixth age, this guy comes up, Adam, that the Most High is loving. He's like, who is this young clown? And you know, in our culture, the firstborn is always the leader. So they're looking at the firstborn, and they're looking at him as a youngin. Like, this little clown, I'm going to run over him too. I'm going to have him raking leaves over there in the vegetation fields or whatever. <laughs> and so Michael comes along and says, no, Behemoth and Leviathan, you turn around and bow down to the young one here. You know what? This has been going on, when you think about it, mm -hmm. all throughout biblical history. Whether it was Cain and Abel, yeah. the eldest slew the youngest, and the most High brought forth Seth to rule, or whether it was uh, Esau and Jacob. Jacob being the youngest, the eldest, was pretty much cast out. Yeah. And it goes on and on and on, especially with the tribes as well. But the most High is presenting this before them. Pride and arrogance stepped in. Let's read. Read that again, point three. <clears throat> fall of Satan, book of Adam, the fall of Satan, 14.3. And I told him, go away from me, for I shall not bow down to him who is younger than me. Indeed, I am master prior to him, and it's proper for him to bow down to me. Adam should bow down to his big brother, is what they're saying. Read on. The six classes of other angels heard that, and my speech pleased them, mm -mm. and they did not bow down to you. Now a confederacy of angels said, you know what, you're right. You're absolutely right. We owed it in him. We shouldn't be bowing down. And the Most High is just watching like, they for real? <laughs> Are they really serious about this? They're going to defy what I told them to do? Let's read. 16.1. Then Abba became angry with us and commanded us, them and me, to be cast down from our dwelling to the earth. As for you, he commanded you to dwell in paradise. The Most High created two realms at this point, which we're going to cover today. And we have to cover it if we're going to bring forth understanding. Right. There was an angelic realm in the heavens, and there was an earthly realm in the earth. There were those who abode in the heaven, and there were those who abode in the earth. The Most High made a covenant with the angelic Godhead, and he made a covenant with those that are in the earth. And so when they rebelled, the Most High is simply saying, you're acting like a feeble human. Mm -mm. You're acting like a base man, carnal man of the earth. And so since you're acting like one, you go live with one. And he immediately cast him out of that angelic realm <clears throat> to dwell in the body of foul serpents and beasts and all of that. I'll be willing we'll cover that today. But Adam remained in paradise, that spiritual realm, angelic and immortal the place where the Most High resides. And he had a charge to come down to earth like an angel and began to govern everything that was in the earth and then go back up. Let's read on. 
16.2. When I had realized that I had fallen before you, that I was in distress, and you were in rest. So when he realized the most I ripped him, stripped him of authority, jealousy came in. Adam still is getting praised by everything, and I have been reduced even further mm -mm. to essentially nothing. Created animosity and tension, and they began to scheme against Adam. Let's read. Then I aimed at hunting you, so that I might alienate you from the paradise of delights, just as I had been alienated because of you. So now we see contention. Now we see the purpose of Hasatan. I want to make sure that Adam does not dwell in paradise. None of you of Adam will ever yeah. go back. Yeah. This is why you say, what have I done to you? I've done nothing. It's not about what you have done. It's what has happened to him because of the most high, him not following the directives of the heavenly father. Simple as that. Let's read on. 17.1. When Adam heard that, he cried in a loud voice and said, Most high, my life is in your hands. Make this enemy distant from mm. me, who desires to lead me astray and seeks to destroy my race. It is by him that Eve has been lost. It says he seek to destroy my race, all of my offspring. So the battle is not just with Adam and Hasatan or Bohemoth and Leviathan. The battle is with Bohemoth and Leviathan and all the offsprings of Adam. It is us against them. And they keep us in ignorance, keep us flaccid, keep us away from our power. But as I said before, the Most High has already ordained that he's going to enlighten us and we're going to stand up a mighty army to fight against Bohemoth and Leviathan. Let's finish this up. 17.2. At that moment, Belier became invisible. As for Adam, he remained in the water and did repentance. But Eve had fallen upon the earth like one dead. All right, so we're going to move from there. We're going to come back to that book in a moment. We're just setting it up so that we can get this clear understanding. If, the first book. If I could add on to that as come, well. Come. Uh, real quick. Uh, in Jubilees, just to uh, bring this point home and make it clear as well. Uh, Jubilees chapter 10. Uh, I'll go ahead and read it. It goes on to say, And the third week in this Jubilee, the unclean demons began to lead astray the children of the sons of Noah mm. and to make to err and destroy them. And the sons of Noah came to Noah their father, and they told him concerning the demons which were leading astray and blinding and slaying his son's sons. And he prayed for the Most High as Abba. So he prays, he gives a sin offering, and it jumps down in the eighth verse. It reads, And the chief of the spirits, Mastema, came and said, Most High Creator, let some of them remain before me, and let them hearken to my voice and to do all that I say unto them. For if some of them are not left to me, I shall not be able to execute the power of my will on the sons of men. For these are for corruption and leading astray before judgment. For great is the wickedness of the sons of men. So proving the point that was brought forth in the book of Adam, how it is a conglomerate of these wicked spirits that have fallen on the fifth day. And uh, they are seeking to destroy Adam and his offspring following down to Noah and past Noah all the way up to Moses, all the way up to David and up to today's times as well. There is a chieftain, chieftain of them on a conglomerate of spirits uh, known as at creation Enoch and Leviathan. Con, a confederacy of evil spirits, demonic forces. And if you don't possess weaponry to destroy every principality, powers, the prince of the power of the air, evil spirits in high places, then you are a victim to them. Mm -hmm. You must possess the power of a sin offering to fight against Hasatan, also known by their ancient names, Leviathan and Bohemoth. These are those that have high animosity against you and I. And as we'll read today, they're doing everything they're, they're, they can to try to enter again. And we're going to show you their little plan. We're going to go to the first book of Adam and Eve. Once again, another powerful book. And all of them coming together paint a beautiful story, a tapestry of godliness and righteousness for us to behold in the latter days. We're going to go to the first book of Adam and Eve, the 48th chapter. We're going to pick it up in the seventh verse.
Khan, 48, verse 7. <clears throat> and they did as he bade them. But as the rock fell down from the mountain upon Adam and Eve, Abba commanded it to become a kind of shed over them. All right, sometimes the different Adam and Eves um, read differently. I'll read it from the one that we have, 48, verse 7. It says, But Satan, the hater of all good, thought within himself, whereas the Most High has promised salvation to Adam. And if you would, go back to the book it. of Adam and Eve. 47. Okay. Uh, you always had 47? Oh, you got Con. it? Okay. Con. Uh, the first book Let's of Adam and Eve, Eve, chapter 47, verse 7. But Satan, the hater of all good, thought within himself, whereas Abba had promised salvation to Adam by covenant. Now check this out. Hasatan saw that the Most High established a covenant with Adam, meaning, and that's clear too, that the Most High had a covenant with Adam. It only makes sense. For you to break a rule, that means you was under the rule, God, right? God. And so for you to fall, that means you was expected to do something. And you was punished for not doing it. So the Most High had a covenant with him. That's covenant one of seven covenants. And so Satan was mad that the Most High made an agreement with him. Made a covenant with him after he fell. A covenant of redemption after a dispensation of time. Let's read on. And that he would deliver him out of all the hardships that have befallen him, but has not promised me by covenant. Oh, Satan was mad God. because they rebelled against the Most High and would not submit to Adam. And the Most High said, I ain't got nothing for you. When it's over, it's over and you are over. Didn't promise redemption to him. So he sought redemption by scheming and conniving. What was his plot? What was his plan? Read. And will not deliver me out of my hardships. Nay, since he has promised him that he should make him and his seed dwell in the kingdom in which I once was, I will kill Adam. Oh, since the Most High said, I will make Adam's children replace me. Hmm. I got a brilliant idea. Kill Adam and all of his descendants. Hmm. And the Most High will have nobody there. So what he's going to do, he's going to turn around and say, wow, Adam is dead. Ha, Satan, come on back up here. I have nobody to fulfill that slot, that place. So this is what's in his mind. You know, when you're desperate, you come up with all kind of crazy oh, stuff. Yeah, kind. And that's the craziest thing that you can hear, that the Most High promised that Adam is going to live, but, you know, I'm going to defeat the Most High so that I can replace Adam. Let's read. Verse 8. The earth shall be rid of him and shall be left to me alone so that when he is dead, he may not have any seed left to inherit the kingdom that shall remain my own realm. Abba will then be in want of me and will restore me to it with my host. All right, we're going back to the book of Adam and we're going to go to the chapter Satan's encounter with the beast. So now we see the plot, the mindset of Ha-Satan. If I kill each and every one of you, if I kill all the saints and all the believers and you don't keep law, statutes, and commandments, I can once rule again. I could be Bohemoth. I could be Leviathan. And then again, all will worship the Most High through me. This is his plot. This is why he comes and tells you secretly and create houses of worship that you don't have to do law. And you can eat pork. And there is no Shabbat. And let's worship this rock and let's worship this stone. All of it is to get you off your foundation so that you can die and that he may live. Right. It is our job not to fall for the trickery and the septifuge. All right, we're going to go to the book of Adam and Eve. We're studying why Adam fell or how he fell. Let's pick it up at the top. Satan's encounter with the beast, 16.1. When the devil came to your father's portion... The devil summoned the serpent and told him, Arise and come to me, and I will teach you a useful word. Then the serpent came, and the devil told the serpent, I hear that you are wiser than all the dumb animals, and I have come to test your wisdom. For Adam gives food to all the animals, thus also to you. When then all the animals come to bow down before Adam from day to day, and from morning to morning every day, you also come to bow down. You are created before him. As large as you are, and you bow down for this little one. Now we hear the same narrative being spoken to the animals in the earth. Remember, Hasatan was made invisible. He's now a spirit, 
And now he's going talking to the natural creatures at that time. All right, he's talking to every one of them saying, I can enter into you. All right, I can enter into you to make you rebellious against Adam like I was rebellious against him. Holding back truth and all of that, but still carrying on with the destruction of Adam. Let's read on though. Well, he goes on and say, you was created before him. And he should be bound down to you and not you to him. But look at what Adam was doing though. He was coming down to every creature saying, now it's time to eat the sacrifices of the Most High. All come together, let's give sacrifices to the Most High. And the animals, the birds would sing as holy singers. And the animals would put themselves before the Most High. And once again praise him in the morning and in the evening when they was in order. But here comes the devil scheming again. Let's read on. And why do you eat food inferior to Adam's and his spouses and not the good fruit of paradise? Letting you know that Adam wasn't eating what they were eating. Pay close attention to this. We're going to talk about his fall in a moment. Adam and his spouse and all of his, they eat in paradise. They come down here with carnal fruit from a carnal tree. And they say, all of you eat of this. We don't eat of that. We eat from a spiritual tree of life. Let's read. But come and hearken to me, so that we may have Adam expelled from the wall of paradise, just as we are outside. Perhaps we can re-enter somehow to paradise. Ah, so now Satan is getting the physical animals on his side, conversing with them, getting into their head, getting a confederacy together to dethrone Adam. Let's expel him. You with me? So that we can re-enter. These serpents and beasts was never in there. How are they going to re-enter? Yeah. It's God. Satan, once again, like a con man on a street corner, you know, with three tops. and you know, Put your money right here. You know, we're going to make this happen. <laughs> so he conned the powers. And I know this sounds, you know, outlandish, but it is truth. You can see these animals sometimes, rabbit, are just vicious. God. It's a demon on them. Dog, you walk by, he's chewing at the fence, a metal fence. He's yeah, chewing on it. Yeah, yeah. It's a demon on him. All right, aggressive, demonic. This is what enters into him. And the same demon that entered into these animals can enter into your brother. And he's chewing on a fence. <laughs> yeah. Rabbit and ready to kill somebody. And so Hasatan, Bohemoth and Leviathan are spirits, sin, that enters in and out for the sole purpose of excluding and expelling you so that you may never, ever, ever enter into the kingdom of the Most High. This is why the Messiah was sent. He kept talking about all you carnal lay people. You keep talking about physicality, washing the outside of the cup, doing this physical thing, mm -hmm. that physical. I'm trying to bring you back to where Adam was in the beginning. Let's read on, priest. And the serpent told him, how can he, how can we have them excluded? The devil replied and told the serpent, be a sheath for me. And Look at that. Be a sheath for me. Hmm. A sheath is the, pretty much the envelope to a sword. You put the sword in there. So how is the serpent or the animal going to be a sheath? Because Satan is going to enter into him. Let me possess your body. Let me enter into you. And I'll do the talking. Hmm. You just sit back and let me control everything. And we're going to go to Genesis 2, Genesis 3, and talk about when Hasatan entered into him, how he used that trickery to beguile our great matriarch Eve. But let's continue to read on. Be a sheath for me, and I will speak to the woman through your mouth, a word by which we will trick them. All right, before we get to that in Genesis 2, let's go to Genesis 1 and 1. All right, we're going to get into a little Hebrew here, but this is not a Hebrew class. We've got a series coming out where we will be, I will willing, breaking down all Genesis 1, possibly 2, and dealing with the direct Hebrew, the translations that we have from some of these Masoretic texts, King James included, NIV, are not accurate, and it was all done on purpose, I believe. But today, the Most High has allowed us to unravel the truth. The House of Wisdom is coming out with our own biblical translation. It's powerful. 
All right, and all the trickery that they put forth is actually going to be cast to the side. We are translating Hebrew upon Hebrew upon Hebrew. That's what we're doing. All right, with the culture of Hebrews. And if you don't have that culture, it is no way for you to translate it. Simple as that. Some things in Hebrew cannot be articulated. All right, you can look at peace and be like, they was waving and saying hello to one another. Mm -hmm. But we know that they was talking about the peace offerings be multiplied and thousands of other little subtleties as well that make a big difference. Let's go real quick to Genesis 1 and 1. And let's read it. In the beginning, Abba created the heavens and the earth. All right, let's read it the way it's, it's written. All right, all this is going to make sense. Just bear with us as we bring all of these pieces of the puzzle together. At the end, it's all going to make sense. Read it again. In the beginning... God created the heaven and the earth. So now, in the King James or, you know, NIV, it's all about the same. In the beginning, God created heaven and earth. And as I said from the onset, it's not, don't it sound like the most I was down here digging a ditch? Mm -hmm. You know, spitting on something, piecing it together, working hard, sweating, wiping his forehead. Well, I got to put that earth together because he created it. it. Seemed like he was right there mustering up the, the energy to do it. This is not the case. And the simple translators knew not, or if they knew, they just deliberately left things out. Today, Abba willing, we're going to translate this first verse as you'll begin to see how it begins to unravel more mysteries and put forth more truth. Read it once again. Genesis 1 and 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Let's bring up the chart that brings forth Genesis 1. All right, we got it up. If we can get it in-house as well. In the beginning, the Most High created the heavens and the earth. We're going to do a word-for-word -word translation in the Hebrew, a Hebrew literal translation. It literally says in the Hebrew, the first word is reshith, but most Hebrews are read it and say bereshith. Now, I want to bore you, those who are not into the Hebrew, it is not Bereshith. You hear brothers say, go to the book of Bereshith. Completely wrong. Wrong. That second letter of the modern Hebrew alphabet, Beth, was placed in there. Once again, you may be reading what you call the Torah. It is a translation of Hebrew. You may be thinking you're reading raw Hebrew. It's not the case. Just like King James Version. They added all kind of adjectives in there, prepositions in there to make it make sense. The Hebrew is not like that. The Hebrew is raw words. It is not bereshith. It is reshith. And that means something different. It could mean in the beginning. But any one of you had a child and said, this is my beginning child. Hmm. No, you would say something like what? My firstborn. Firstborn, absolutely. You would use the term first. And so here we have the term reshith, which simply means first. They added the beth to it to try to connote in the and then they put in their beginning now when it comes to Hebrew there's a choice of words that you can use if you can contextualize if you know the Hebrew culture if you know it you know which one to place in there right. like they have a word reshon, which is talking about the first fruit they may have bachar, which is talking about bringing forth your firstborn you have to know which one to place in there if you don't know the Hebrew culture you just I guess in the beginning child better sheath yeah better sheath and that's not the case. When you see reshith, it's always talking about the product of a sapient being. Like he'll talk about the reign of Zedekiah, the reshith, the beginning of his reign. It's talking about what he did. He did this. He rolled on this camp. He did that. He did that. It's what you produce. Why? So befitting, right? Because Genesis is about what the Most High did. And I'm going to tell you this as a footnote. It would be blasphemous for anybody to write this and say something like, in the beginning there was nothing and then there was God and then God created you are implying that you was here before the most high all right so the Hebrews knew not to do that not to say that you will never find what is called the tetragrammaton in Genesis 1 it is already implied that the Abba the most high was here he's doing these things okay just like in uh, we don't have to go there but John 1 and 1 in the beginning was the word and the word was with the most high all right, so the Most High was already here. They didn't even talk about when he showed up on the scene because you can't talk about when he showed up on the scene because he's before days. He's older than anything. He's older than old. 
And so you talk about his fruit. In Genesis 1, it's talking about his shoot, uh, his works. The term reshith is saying first. We're breaking down just this one verse. We're breaking down the whole entire chapter in the series. All right, reshith. Not better sheath. It's talking about the first. Now, we have the second word in this is bera. Bera is create, so we're not going to contest that. We have first of creation Elohim. If you'll give me that in uh, Romans 1, I believe 19. We have that translation. Now, if you was only taking the root words, if you was only taking the root word, I'm going to translate the root words in English. Once again, no prepositions, no adjectives, none of that. It will simply say first creation, angels, eth which we're going to talk about in a moment, eth, earth. That's it. First creation, angels, heaven, earth. Now, who would read a Bible that's like that? Now, you talk thousands of chapters, so they had to translate it to English. They have to add, you know, other words in there to connect and bring forth that thought, that understanding. But you can add things, and you can take away from things that actually changes the narrative, and they have changed the narrative here. This is not in the beginning God, the Most High, is not even mentioned here. He's already here. All right? So first, better created, or creation, were the Elohim. If we could pull up the second chart about Elohim. Once again, the word-for-word -word translation is literally first, uh, which would be Oreshith, better Elohim, uh, Shemayim, Eretz. These basic words. It's literally seven words in the first chapter, and that's amazing too. The most I start off the Bible with seven words. Hmm. Fulfill 7,000 years, seven covenants, it's just amazing. I won't get into that. But we move over to first creation, Elohim. What are or what is the Elohim? The King James turns around and said that that's God, but that's not the most high. That's not the most high. What is it? It is the angelic Godhead as we was always we was already reading he created Leviathan Bohemoth he created all these angels to create he's the architect we are the archetype and he created all this stuff he sent them on a mission go create water go create land go create vegetation they're called the Elohim let's get it in Romans 119 I believe uh, because that yeah because that which may be known of Abba is manifested in them for Abba has showed it unto them. For the invisible thing of him from the creation of the world. So we're talking about the invisible things from the beginning. Remember, out of nothing came water. Out of nothing came vegetation. Out of nothing came something. The invisible things from the creation of the world, read, are clearly seen. The Most High is clearly explaining it to you, showing it to you, read. Being understood by the things that are made. Being understood by us who were created in the beginning. Let us make man in our image. We understand it now. What are we understanding? Read. Even his eternal power and Godhead. We are now understanding the Elohim, the Godhead, the confederacy of angels. So if you read simply the King James or any NIV or whatever, and you're not going to the direct word for word literal translation, you think the Most High was down here with a shovel and a pickaxe making South America, hmm. making Jerusalem, making the Arctic and the Poles. He wasn't doing that. His first creation, Reshith Bera, was the Elohim. First created was the Elohim. Let's go back to Genesis 1. Let's read it once again. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth... So now we have here the Most High. I'm going to pause here for a second because there's a lot of meat in this. The Most High created, as we have already brought out, right? Reshith is the first. Bera is creation. Elohim is the Godhead. And there's a word that they left out. It's amazing how many brothers speak Hebrew and get a Hebrew translated Torah. Don't go back to the root word because they purposely left the word, two words out. Two words out. And that word is eth. It's completely left out. And if you look it up in any kind of lexicon, they'll say that this word is not translatable in English. <laughs> You're telling me English, they got like a dozen words for one thing, yeah. 
can't translate this. <laughs> English is one of the hardest languages to learn because does to mean T-W-O or T-O? Oh, or is it T-O-O? <laughs> or what? Which one? Is, they don't have, and then all the slang around it too? None. You can't articulate. The, they purposely said, I don't want to put this in there. First of all, it don't fit our narrative. Second of all, the saints may come and find this word F out. Let's find this word F about what it is. What is this word F? You're going to pull up the chart, Doc? All right, we're going to deal with this word F for a moment before we go on and read this whole verse. Bring the chart up when you get it. All right, we're going to go first, if you would, um, Gabaria, go to Genesis 4.15. We're going to get this same usage. Once again, those of you who are studious, go to a word-for-word -word Hebrew uh, lexicon and look at Genesis 1. Once again, no adjectives, none of that, no preposition, none of that. Just word for word what it says. And you'll find out that these two words, eth, is mentioned twice, right before earth, right before heaven, shemayim. It says eth shemayim. It says eth eretz. What does that mean? It means something. And how dare they not translate it? Mm. Because it translates for your liberty. So they turn around and translate it in Genesis 4.15, but not I mean, Exodus, Genesis 4.15, yeah, absolutely. And then also in Exodus 31, verse 12. Genesis 4.15, And the heavenly Father said unto him, Therefore, whosoever slay Cain, vengeance shall be taken upon him sevenfold. And that term sevenfold is Shebanai. And this actually goes back to Shebawa. Talks about the seventh, the Shabbat. We're going to come back and break that down as well. We want to talk about Cain, though. What was about Cain? What was so important? Read. And the heavenly father set a mark upon Cain. Set a mark. Guess what that word mark is here? Sign. It goes back to that word eth. It goes to the root word of eth, which you'll bring up the chart, oth. And you'll find it if those who read the Hebrew in many lexicons, some of you like the Strong's or the Young's, you'll find it in the Strong's uh, H226. All right, oth is the root word of eth. They translated it here, though. Put a mark on Cain, but they didn't put it in Genesis. Hmm. It's amazing how you can do that. We're going to bring this out. So it still sounds ambiguous if you don't understand what the mark of Cain is about. Many people break this down and try to get physical with it. It was his complexion. Uh, that's not what the Most High is talking about. Let's get it in Exodus 31. Verse 12, we're still dealing with oth, which is the root word of eth that's used in Genesis 1 and 1. And the Mosai spake unto Moses, saying, Speak thou unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbath ye shall keep, for as a sign between uh, me. Once again, the word oth or eth is being used, and they translate it to sign now. Sign between me and you. Continue to read. Mm. It is a sign between me and you throughout your generations. So the Most High said, Moses, Masha, tell the children of Israel that I have established a covenant with you. And in that covenant, the Shabbat is a sign. Now all the covenants, all seven of them got or have signs. The Most High established a covenant with Noah. And what was the sign? Rainbow, absolutely. He established a covenant with Abraham. And what was the sign? Circumcision. He established a covenant with Moses. And what was the sign? The Shabbat. Absolutely. Every seven days, this is the sign. You in covenant with me. All of them got signs. All right. And so now, Eth or Oth is talking about the sign of what? A covenant. All right. A covenant. Let's get it. Let's read on down to the 16th verse. Exodus chapter 31 verse 16. Wherefore the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. It is a perpetual covenant, which is what? It is a sign. That covenant them. is a sign. So oath and eth is talking about a mark of your covenant with the Heavenly Father. Let us clearly understand that. The Most High put a mark upon Cain. He made a covenant with Cain. And we're going to talk about his covenant in a moment. Let's go back to Genesis 4.15 and talk about the covenant that the Most High put upon Cain. Cain said, Abba, 
My curse is too hard to bear. The most I say, I'll make an agreement with you. All right. Anybody that comes against you through Shebana, these 7,000 years, vengeance shall be taken upon them. Read it again. Give me Job 7.20. And Please the heavenly done. father said unto him, Therefore, whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken upon him sevenfold. Most I said, I make an oath with thee. All right. An eth with thee, a covenant with thee. Anybody attack you for these seven, Shebana, these 7,000 years, vengeance is going to be upon them. Now I'm going to show you what that means. Let's read. And the Heavenly Father set a mark upon Cain. All right, he put that eth upon the same word that's written in Genesis 1. One and one. It's translated here, but not translated there for a reason. I'm going to talk about it. But let's break down the mark of Cain before we go back to Genesis 1. Give me Job 7.20. And if you'll give me Jeremiah 2.22. Job chapter 7 verse 20. I have sinned. What shall I do unto thee, O thou preserver of men? Why hast thou set me as a mark against thee? So that I am burdened to myself. So that we have the same terminology being used right with Job. Why have you set a mark against me? Just like the mark that was on Cain. Now, what does that mean? An oath, an eth, a covenant. What was the covenant that he made with Cain? Let's read. Verse 21. And why dost thou not pardon my transgression and take away my iniquity? Whoa, sounds very familiar to what Hasatan said to Adam. The Most High has made a covenant with you, but he has not made a covenant with me. He will forgive you in 7,000 years, but he says, kick rocks to me. I'm going to burn in the end. So now we have Job reiterating the same thing that was given to Cain. There is a mark, a covenant that the Most High will not forgive. And so go ahead and cause all kind of evil for 7,000 years. Go do what you want to do. Because no matter what you do, whether you seek repentance with tears and crying, you shall not receive it. None whatsoever. So what are you going to do? The righteous will still be obedient to the Heavenly Father. And just hope and pray that the Most High will have mercy. But wicked people, hey, <laughs> it's your best life ever. You know, do what we do. We got to get it in because once the sun go down, it's over. You only live once. <laughs> so let's be wicked as we can ever be. This is what the covenant is with Cain. And he is doing it. Mm. That's why when you go to people with the spirit of Cain on them and you start talking to them about doing righteous, they're looking at you like, you clown. Hmm. <laughs> that don't benefit me at all. Yeah, That's your lot in life. And I'm going to try to keep you from going into the kingdom of the most high. Get Jeremiah 2.22 talking about the exact same mark or oath or eth. Then we're going back to Genesis 1, I'll be willing. Or first Enoch, the book of Enoch 69. Go ahead and read that Jeremiah 2.22. For though thou wash thee with nitri, most I said, though you get bleach, you go get you some nitroglycerin and gasoline <laughs> mixed with kerosene and start scrubbing your skin. Read. And take thee much soap, yet thine iniquity is marked before me. You are marked. You are marked. There is no forgiveness. It's crazy how some of our contemporaries in the church, Jesus will forgive you for everything. Mm. Everything. Not to Cain. All right? And not to those that are of Cain, which is a whole nother class. The Most High has no forget. That's the covenant that he made. With Adam, forgiveness at a dispensation of time. Mm. For Cain, Hasatan, there is no forgiveness. And anybody that give their life over to Bohemoth and Leviathan, give their lives over like the serpent. He was like, let me enter into you. You be the sheep. I'll be the sword. I'll talk through you. If you're allowing that to happen today, there is no None, no salvation for you. You have to remove him out of you and become clean so that you can receive salvation. All right, so we now covered what oath or eth is. It is a sign, a mark of a covenant. Remember, if you read the original Hebrew, Genesis 1-1, you will see seven words in there. All right, and before Shemayim, there's a oath or eth, and before Eretz, which is heaven and earth, you find, you find the same word, eth. All right, we're going to go, before we go back to Genesis 1, book of Enoch 69, verse 1. Let 
69 one? I got it. Okay. And after this judgment, they shall terrify and make them to tremble, because they have shown this to those who dwell on the earth. And behold the names of those angels. The name of the first, Yaquan. All right, so now Enoch is showing you the actual name of the confederacy of angels that were called Behemoth and Leviathan. What was the first name? First, Jacon. That is, the one who led astray all the sons of Abba. Ah, these are the ones that go in and out the earth leading astray the sons of Abba. Let's read on. And brought them down to the earth and led them astray through the daughters of men. So we now see who brought down the sons of the Most High that was on that holy mountain. This is not talking about the sons of Seth when they fell. We're talking about somebody that was here before them coming into their minds, mm -hmm. saying that we can do this, we can do that. All of it is to expel you from the kingdom. And they were in the temple of the Most High. The Most High adopted them and called them his children. And they was allowed to enter into that realm. Satan came with that same old foolishness. Same old foolishness that he came to the serpent with. Promising him all kind of gifts that he wasn't able to give. Let's read on. Verse 5. And the second name, Asbiel. He imparted to the holy sons of Abba evil counsel and led them astray so that they defiled their bodies with the daughters of men. All right. So now if you would, yeah, continue. To, go to the sixth verse real quick. And the third was named Gadriel. He it is who showed the children of men all the blows of death. Showed them how to kill each other. And what else did he do? What did Gadriel do? And he led astray Eve. Ah, he's the one that was actually in the body of these serpents talking to Eve. Hey, eat of this thing. Consume of this. Don't think that Hasatan is just one man red with horns on his head and a pitchfork. All right, that's cartoonish. Reality is a confederacy of angels that was made in heaven to run the waters and run the earth and to keep sacrifices for Adam. They didn't want to bow down to him. The Most High put him in the earth as spirits and they now dwell in carnal bodies. Now we're calling them out by name. Calling them out by name in their actions that they have done. Let's read on. And show the shield and the coat of mail. All right, they did all kind of things that they ought not have done. All right, let's pick it up in the 13th verse. So that we can understand Genesis 1. And this is the task of Casbiel, the chief of the oath. Oh, we have Casbiel, who is the chief over the covenant, the oath that was in heaven. The Most High gave him authority. When we go back to Genesis, you'll begin to see that the Most High, the first of creation, were the angelic Godhead. He made a covenant with them in heaven, and he made a covenant with man in earth. This is what's extracted out of the first verse, which changed the entire narrative of Genesis, the first chapter. The Most High made a covenant. Covenant is everything. So important it's in the first verse of Genesis that they so happily decided to just extract, because you don't need that. You don't need to know about no covenant. Hmm. Just need to know that the Most High was digging a hole, and in that hole he created the earth. So here we have Casbiel, the chief over the oath and covenant. Read on. Which he showed to the holy ones when he dwelt high above in glory. And his name is Bika. Ah, we now have the name of that heavenly covenant was called Bikwa or Bika. They called it this holy covenant for the angels, Adam, and everybody that was in Shemayim. Mm. Or heaven. The Most High made a oath or eth in Shemayim, in heaven. Let's read on. This angel requested Michael to show him the hidden name, that he might enunciate it in the oath, so that those might quake before the name and oath who revealed all that was in secret to the children of men. All right, so now we're talking about an oath for the earth now. That was an earth called Bika in heaven and so now we have one of these fallen ones saying hey, give me the power of this earthly one now so that I can reign in the earth why did he go to Micah Michael if you would pause right there priest and you'll go to the 20th chapter of the book of Enoch he didn't go to any of the other archangels like 
Penuel or Repaya Allah, any of them. He went directly to Michael for a reason. Why did he go to Michael? Let's get uh, chapter 20, verse 5 about Michael. Michael. Michael Allah in the Hebrew. Read on. Michael, one of the holy angels, to wit, he that is set over the best part of mankind. Okay, let me go to the one that's over the man in the earth. I don't want Repaya Allah. I don't want any of those. I want to talk about Michael Allah, Michael, because I have a covenant for the men in earth. And I want to reign over it. Hmm. I want them to worship me through this covenant. Once again, trickery, septifuge, trying to fit in, trying to handle the work of the word of the Most High. Let's go back to where you were in the uh, 69th chapter. Pick it up again in the fifth. What were you? Um, 14. This requested Michael to show him the hidden name that he might enunciate it in the oath so that those might quake before the name and oath who revealed all that was in secret to the children of men and this is the power of this oath for it is powerful and strong and he placed this oath a K in the hand of Michael ah now we have this other oath carnal in earth to Ica Akia and we have two covenants now one in heaven, one in earth. And if you're in earth, you behave carnal. You engage in carnal things because it's a carnal agreement. But those of us who are spiritual minded want to be with Bika, a Bikwa in heaven, a heavenly covenant that was here from the beginning of time. And they sought to, once again, through trickery, to get you Adam to get inside Akia. They wanted Adam to leave Bikwa and get into the earthly one. One had the fruit from the tree of life. One had the fruit from the tree of good and evil. Hmm. Both of them worshiped the Heavenly Father, but angels were not permitted to come into Achaia. And those that was in earthly covenants, Achaia could not come to Bequa. The Most High divided it for his own purpose. And he told Adam, do not ever eat of the covenant of Achaia. Just simply leave it alone. That's for man carnal that was to be born on the earth. And we're going to be talking about this as we go on in this series as, again with great specificity. You have to understand that man was created on the earth, when, how, where, we're gonna show it. I'll be willing. All right, you'll finish that priest. Verse 16, and these are the secrets of this oath, and they that are strong. Check that out, these are the secrets of the earth, dot, dot, dot. <laughs> they stole it, they took it away. We don't want them to know, because if they would have put it, they would have put all the writings of the Mosaic Covenant. They would have had it all right there. Moses said, I come this day to give you good and evil. Life and death in Deuteronomy 30. What is that? The tree of good and evil. So they snatched that out so you wouldn't catch it. This is a carnal covenant for lay carnal men. But what did it say about that covenant? Read. And these are the secrets of this oath. And they are strong that through his oath. That oath is strong. And they are strong in that oath. That oath has power. What is the strength of that earth, of that oath? Anybody know? You'll grab it, 1 Corinthians 15, I believe. 54. Mm -hmm. What is the strength of that oath? How is strong? Absolutely. Right on point. Somebody said it. Let's read it in scripture. That the oath is strong. It's so strong that it has you captive, incarcerated. You can't even move. Let's read. Uh, for the corrupt, though. I got you. Um, 56? Come on, you got okay. It? Yeah. yeah. Uh, the sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin. The strength of sin, read, is the law. Is the law of that covenant. Sin loves Akia. Loves it. What do you mean? When in Akia it says, Honor the Sabbath and keep it holy, and you dishonor the sab Sabbath and have it unholy. He rubs his little mittens together and say, "Got him." Hmm, hmm. Go to the Most High and say, "They broke the covenant of him." Me as an evil spirit, can I enter into them? Can they be a sheaf for me? They love it. It's strong. It subdues carnal men and stop them in their tracks. And so they fell in love with it. 
And so they couldn't rule like Adam, but they said we can rule through this covenant. And if we have a covenant of 7,000 years, we might as well live it up. God. We might as well enter into them and be pimps and drug dealers, whores and killers and warmongers and whatever. Let's make this our best life while we're here. And so now, let's go back to where you were. And Enoch, we're going to slide over, finish up in 69. Verse 16. And these are the secrets of this oath. And they are strong through his oath. And the heaven was suspended before the world was created and forever. So he's saying in the beginning this oath, this eth was there before everything was created. The Most High made the angelic Godhead with a oath in heaven and then an oath or a covenant in earth with man that was born in the earth. Two covenants. Let's read on. Verse 17. And through it, the earth was founded upon the water. And from the secret recesses of the mountains came beautiful waters. And from the creation of the world unto eternity. And through that oath, the sea was created. So the Most High is telling you, through that oath, the sea was created. Vegetation was created. The sun, moon, and the stars were created. All these things were created. Letting you know what oath is what f is that they just so happily just took out letting you know exactly what it is but the mysteries are being revealed in the latter days it's power in it let's go back to genesis 1 and 1 and let's do a transliteration and then a final translation and if you would second appreciate done get galatians 4 24. in the beginning god created the heaven and the earth. Once again, word for word translation. Reshith, Bera, Elohim, Oth, Shemayim, Oth, Iret. Which translates to, this will be our translation. We have to put, you know, prepositions and adjective in there so we're just not throwing a rocky translations in there, okay? It is the first of creation were the angelic Godhead with an angelic covenant in heaven and an earthly covenant with common man on earth this is the genesis one in one actual translation and if they was off on that first verse i mean they don't have a chance when it comes to the rest of it yeah. it's a simplistic fairy tale when they break it down you know it's almost like you know when these so-called christians you know teach and you know first thing they do when it's like oh you're going to teach sunday school they get somebody that don't know anything and what do they go to they either go to noah's ark or they go to Genesis 1. <laughs> Both of them are fairy tale for the children. The Most High created the heavens. And what did they do? Two butt naked people with leaves over their genitalia picking an apple. And they start fairy telling on. But this ain't fairy tale. This is the real deal. The Most High made a covenant with the angels in heaven and made a covenant with common man on earth. Now we can begin to understand how and why he fell. All right, let's get Galatians 4.24 before we bring it all the way back. Galatians 4, 24. Which things are an allegory, for these are the two covenants. Ah, uh, Paul speaks about the two covenants, allegories. What are these two covenants? Read. The one from the Mount Sinai. One was Mount Sinai that Moses went and got, which was a continuation of all the carnal covenants. Read. Which gendereth to bondage. It genders to captivity. Why? The strength of sin. Mm -hmm. It's when you break any one of those. You don't circumcise in Abraham's covenant? What happened? Death. Death. Or sin come and takes you over. Moses' covenant? If you do not worship the Most High on the Shabbat, what happens? Death. Death. Incarceration through sin. They gender to bondage. Read. Verse 25. For this Agar is Mount Sinai. So he's talking about Ishmael's wife. I mean, uh, Abraham's wife who fathered or mothered Ishmael. Read on. In Arabia, and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. All right. So because of what happened in Mount Sinai, which is in Arabia, they were saying, absolutely, it was there. That's where they came. The children of Israel find themselves always in captivity. Let's read. Verse 26. But Jerusalem, which is above. But the city of peace, where the true peace offerings at, is where? Which is above. It's Bequa. It's in heaven. Hmm. This is the original one. Read. It's free. It's free. 
It's not about bondage. It's not about you breaking it. It's none of that. You are innately built to be a part of that. You love doing it. There is no, you know, hardship. Read. Which is the mother of us all. It's the creator of all the sons and daughters of Adam. This is where we come from. We're not of the earth, earthly. And those who are earthly, they love this place. They are the one that blossom in this place. And you be wondering, how did they start that and do that? Yeah. Because they're earthly. And you are more in the spirit. You're thinking about amazing things and taking amazing journeys that you can't fulfill because you are in a carnal body. Now, Paul is speaking about these two covenants. You got Bequa and Achaia. Which one were you going to choose? You could stay carnal. And if you stay carnal and earthly, that means you were a basic primordial carnal man that was created to be governed. But if you require spirituality, you are answering to Bequa, that heavenly covenant that was given to the angelic Godhead. All right, we're going to leave from there. And we're going to go back to Enoch 69. And then we're going to finish up Genesis 1 and 1 again. Actually, I see the time. Let's move over straight over to the book of Adam. I believe everybody get the point. The book of Adam, and we're going to go back to Satan's encounter with the beast. And we're going to pick it up in the 44th verse, 16.3. And if you'll get Genesis 2.16, so we can come full circle here. The book of Adam, Satan's encounter with the beast, 16.3a. Then the serpent came, and the devil told the serpent, Jump down to 16.3c. And why do you eat food inferior to Adam's and his spouses and not the good fruit of paradise? But come and hearken to me so that we may have Adam expelled from the wall of paradise. All right. So we see clearly here Hasatan talking to the serpent and saying, why do you eat of Akia, the earthly sacrifices? And you're not eating of Bequa. Adam is so superior very possible that we may expel him and knock him out of his lofty high perch you can eat that stuff too we got to get them to eat this low level food low level sacrifice remember they're talking about eating not just talking about breakfast and lunch and dinner we're talking about they ate the sacrifice the sacrifice was a meat offering a grain offering drink offering and you did it morning noon and evening as we have said on thousands of occasions this is where they get breakfast lunch and dinner from because the saints gave these sacrifices thrice in a day. Actually, all 12 lots of the day. But these are the main ones that they brought forth. And so they ate what they sacrificed to the Heavenly Father. And the Gentiles saw it and said, hey, it must be three dinners a day. That's what it is. It's not that. It's morning sacrifice, noon sacrifice, and evening sacrifice to the Most High. And that's what they were doing in heaven, eating of the fruit of the tree of life. And in earth, carnal beings... We're eating of carnal food. Now remember that. Keep that in your mind. We're going to move from there to go to Genesis 2.16. And the heavenly father, our Abba, commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. Of the covenant of Bequa in the garden in heaven, you sacrifice anything you want and eat of it, Adam. Read. But of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Achaia, the second covenant that's on earth for carnal men. Read. Thou shalt not eat of Don't it. eat that sacrifice. You are angelic. You're going down to the basement and eating low-grade food. Read. For in the day that thou eatest If thereof, you do eat that sacrifice. If you do. I'm not belittling anybody. But just think about you have a chef. And he's making seven course meals and delicious dainties flown from all over the earth. And then you have a bag of Alpo that you feed Ruffy in the back. And the Most High said, you eat this delicate dinner here. I don't want to ever catch you eating that Alpo. Don't do that. If you eat that Alpo, I'm going I'm to I'm take it that you are a dog. All right? Don't eat it. You're not a dog. You're not a beast. You're not an animal. Leave it alone. But Satan gets smart. And come through the dog and say, ooh, this is delicious. <laughs> this is delicious. You, you take the kibbles? It's better than any steak you've ever had. Try it, Adam. And through Eve, she threw a couple of kibbles in her mouth. 
Saved a couple and said, Adam, kibbles are out. They're actually delicious. You know? mm. And he ate of it. Look at it that way. But we're going to break it down. Let's read on. Thou shalt surely die. You will separate from the Most High. Spiritual death, Deuteronomy 30, 15, is when you separate from the Most High. Deuteronomy 32, 20 talks about if you leave the Most High, you shall be devoid of faith. All right? It's like a branch broken off from the, most, from the, from the uh, trunk. You die. So spiritual death is separating from the Most High, which caused a physical expiration as well. So the Most High was telling Adam that if you eat that Alpo, you can't come and eat at my table no more. Mm. You've been eating out of the dog bowl. All right, I don't want you at my table for 7,000 years. All right, so this is what the Most High was telling him. This is in simple layman's term. When we translate Genesis, the whole first chapter, you begin to see it's different than what has been handed to us. Let's go to Genesis 3.1. Now the serpent was more subtile. All right. We now know the serpent, Casbiel, of the Satanic Federation was in the serpent doing what? He was subtle. He was very subtle and conniving. He wanted to get Adam to eat the Alpo. Let's read. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the heavenly father Abba had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea. Has Abba said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Has the Most High said, you are to only eat from the table where you catered and chefs and all manner of beautiful dainties from all over the world? He said, you can only eat that? Read on. And the woman said unto the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in, is in the midst of the garden, Abba has said, ye shall not eat of it. Neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Abba said, don't eat of the Alpo. The day you eat of the fruit of Achaia, the earthly covenant, we shall die. Now, she's thinking of physical death, but it's more than a physical death. You will be ostracized from the Heavenly Father. You behave like a dog, the Most High going to treat you like a dog. Mm. And it's like that for us in these latter days. You behave like angels, the Most High sees that you want to be back in Bequa. But if you behave earthly and you smoking, crack and killing, stealing, selling your body and all the things that earthly base people do, then you must love that earthly covenant. You must want to be there because angels don't behave that way. Let's read on. And the serpent said unto the woman, ye shall not surely die. All right, he's lying to her, or telling half truth. You right. I mean, he was somewhat right. You eat the alpo. It's not rat poison. You're not going to kill over him. Ah, uh, dead. So a, Satan sitting there with kibbles, eating and throwing them in his mouth. I'm not dead. What are you talking about? Most I lying. Telling half truths again. He popped them in her mouth. She probably stood around for an hour or two. He did not die. He's not even sick. He's running around the track doing push-ups. This thing is healthy. He did not die. He shall not die, not knowing that the Heavenly Father is talking about, I'm going to separate. We're not going to be together. I am your life. Cleave unto me. You'll be alive. Let's read on. For Abba doeth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. He's now telling a part truth now. You will know something that the Most High knows, which is the earthly covenant and the heavenly covenant, but the Most High didn't want you to know that. So now you're trying to do something outside of the purpose of the Most High. He wanted you to be in what is called Bikwa, the heavenly covenant. And there's so many things open up if you just apply your mind. Go to the Messiah and think about what he was trying to do. He was trying to get the Pharisees and the Sadducees out of that carnal covenant. He was trying to give them that spiritual covenant. When Moses came down and his face was shining, what covenant was he trying to bring them to? Bikwa, absolutely. But they said, put a veil over your face and give us a kia. I don't want that. I want some physical stuff we can do. And Moses reluctantly gave it to him. The Most High has always for seven, six millennia been trying to bring you back into the original covenant. But we prefer carnality. And we have failed every time except this time. Except this time. The Most High has given it to us again and the saints have grasped it. We are sick. We are sick of that carnal covenant. Uh -huh. Because we can't do it and it holds us captive. And it has done nothing for us, but has strengthened our enemies. Let's read on. The sixth verse. Call a chapter again, too. Uh, chapter 3, verse, verse 6. 
And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eye, and the tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat. All right, she ate the carnal sacrifice, and she became carnal. Once again, the angelic nature was ripped from them. Read on. And gave also unto her husband. And brought it to Adam and said, this was delicious. Eat it. Read. With her, and he did eat. So when you eat of the sacrifice, you're joined to that thing that you're worshiping. All right, and so they became carnal like the carnal men or beings and creatures that was in the earth, and the Most High was upset with them. They went from being creme de la creme, head honcho, the top one, to being the base men. And this is why you'll read in Isaiah 14 that the trees around them said, you have fallen and become weak mm -hmm. as us. Wow, you used to shake the earth. You weaker than us now. Looking at Adam, who used to come in the morning, feed them, give them sacrifices, give oblations. Now he's down there with them. Mm -mm. They giving oblations for him. They like, wow, how have things changed? Let's read on. And the eyes of them were both open and they knew that they were naked. They knew that the Most High took their spirit out of the spiritual body and they were now in a carnal body. They did not have on that glorious garment that angelic garment. And those who read the book of Adam and Eve, he talks about that. He's like, I got this flesh. I got this skin. Yeah. I got these eyeballs. I can only see a few feet. I used to see past universes. I used to see colors that I can't see right now. I'm smelling carnal things. It was different. So they was instantly changed and put in that body. Call it chapter and verse. Chapter 3, verse 7 in Genesis. And the eyes of them both were open and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together. Anybody know why they put fig leaves on? Is that a metaphor? What's that, anybody? When you give a sacrifice, obviously there are many components of it, right? We have a grain or a vegetable offering called a meat offering and we have a flesh offering and a drink offering so he's talking about the figs, physical, that they brought and ate of. They began to clothe themselves with the actual leaves from it. This was the sacrifice that they brought. And not only that, you're going to see that they put fur on because they began to, after they gave that actual flesh sacrifice, they put that on too. Because they became mortal man at this point. Engaging in that carnal sacrifices make you carnal. So they took the things that they sacrificed and used it to cover their physical body. All right, let's read on. And they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Heavenly Father walking through the garden in the cool of the day. Ah, anybody know what that means? Now, this is Adam on the sixth day he was created. You'll find out the day he was created is the same age that he fell sixth day and to make it to the seventh yet he fell before the seventh came and remember what the heavenly father was doing he said give them the book of light let them create water let them create grain let them create the time of worship let them bring forth the 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 uh, beast for sacrifices so that on the seventh day they can give this to me all right so the sixth day came adam fell adam tripped and so the most high came in the cool of the morning what is the cool of the morning First lot, absolutely, it's the beginning of the next day. So if this is the sixth day, this is so-called Friday. All right, he fell on that day and went and, and, and buried his head in misery. And the Most High came around for the morning oblations. The cool of the morning, came for the morning sacrifice. The man that I created and all the instruments of sacrifice, the Most High is rubbing his hand and said, let it be done. I'm ready to eat my sacrifices. Where you at, Adam? Where's Eve? Where you, where you at? You're a little late. You never can't be late. Hmm. Read. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of Abba amongst the trees of the garden. And the heavenly father called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. All right. So he knew that he broke Bequa that spiritual covenant and began to eat of Achaia, that earthly covenant. And he was reduced immediately. He was ashamed. He was ashamed. 
to present himself before the Heavenly Father. All right, for time's sake, we've still got a lot to go through. We're going to jump down to the 21st verse. And if you'll hold Wisdom of Solomon 2.23, executive priest, you're done. Let's read. Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Heavenly Father make coats of skin and clothed them. All right, once again, took the figs from the meat or grain offering and took the skins from the sacrifice that he had gave and said, you might as well wear that because you're going to be here for a long time. Read on. And the Heavenly Father said, Behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. The man has become as one of us. <clears throat> Not only did he know Bequa at one point, he's now aware of Achaia, good and evil, the earthly. He know both covenants. Both covenants. And the angels, Elohim, that created them, obviously is aware of both. Adam wasn't aware. He wasn't part of the Elohim. He was created by the Elohim. And so now... He's aware of both. And if anything good came from this, it is that. Is that we are aware of Bequa, the good covenant, and we are also, through experience, Son. aware of that earthly covenant. And I don't want nothing to do with it. You would have to be broken and demented if the Most High accept you back into the heavenly covenant Man, to do this all that. over again. Mm. You're going to stay away from that thing like the plague. All right? That's the only thing. We get faith and experience from it. Adam didn't have it. Eve, if she would have had it, she would have been Sean and Hasatan, all of them. Don't talk to me. Talk to the hand. Matter of fact, talk to the man. Talk to Adam. And Adam would have been like, bounce, man. Get up out of here before I burn you on this altar. Get up out of here. Don't talk to me. But he didn't. He didn't. He fell victim to it. All right, let's finish that, priest. And now, Genesis 3 and 22. And now, at least he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life. Ah, uh, now if he turned around and come back into the heavenly eth, heavenly covenant, read, and eat, and eat those fruit from the tree of life, which he once did, read, and live forever. He will be eternal once again. Letting you know that you can do this. As you fail, you can actually be redeemed because you're not Hasatan. You're not Cain. They don't have a chance to come back. They're scheming and plotting, trying to kill Adam so the Most High by default has to pull them back. But you, you have all the authority to come back and eat of that heavenly covenant. This is why Hasatan took it out of the first verse. He didn't want you to know that the very first thing, Most High made a covenant in heaven with the angels and a covenant man on earth. Don't prefer the covenant in earth. You got Israel shining, talking about the covenant in earth. That's all they doing is promoting Moses. Every Shabbat is Shabbat this and Shabbat that and everything is polishing up the earthly covenant. But not once did a word come out about the heavenly covenant because they are carnal. But the Most High said, if you come back, you will be like the angels. You will live immortal forever. But there's an impediment. What is that impediment? Therefore, the heavenly Father sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. Why till the ground? Because the earthly covenant, you had to bring earthly sacrifices. And so he had to be uh, agrarian, an agriculturalist. He had to bring forth. Put in that work. Uh, absolutely, he had to put in work, the sweat of his face, to bring forth sacrifice. And the most high, to make it harder for him, scorched the earth. <laughs> and he said, all right, in a desert now, bring forth some corn. And bring forth some wheat and some tomatoes and watermelons. I'd like to see you grow a watermelon in the desert. He couldn't do it. And if you don't do it, you trespass. And if you trespass, Hasatan get to own you. It was a vicious circle. Mm. Read on. So he drove out the man. Here's the key point. He took the man from that spiritual point and made him carnal. Read. And he placed him at the east. And placed him at a geographical location here in the earth. I'm not talking about hyperbole. I'm not talking about some space stop. This is a physical geographical place on the earth. And the most I said, start your sentence right there. I will never be far from you though. If you behave yourself accordingly, I will always be next to you. You may even hear me and smell the place where you used to be. If you stay here and stay righteous, but we know that that didn't happen. We're going to cover it, though. All right? This is the fall of Adam. Finish that. And he placed uh, and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims 
and a flaming sword which turneth every way to keep the way of the tree of life. And we've covered this on many occasions at cherubim, flaming sword, is talking about mystifying what happened on that fourth day. They could not, Adam could not find out again what we now know. He couldn't remember the days of worship and sacrifice and how to sacrifice, any of that. So if you don't know when, where, and how to sacrifice, you can't come back. Now the flaming sword has been removed. And the Most High is allowing us to come back. You just got to take the charge. Wisdom of Solomon 2.23 in the Apocrypha. And, uh, this is almost reminiscent of when you come into this covenant and you leave. It's like the wisdom is taken from you and you've forgotten everything that you've learned when you were in this covenant. Con. I've seen it firsthand. Yeah, I've seen men, scholars and sages and leave out and become goofy and dumb. I mean, weird, because yeah. wisdom stripped herself out and she took the wallpapers off the wall. She didn't, want no, she didn't want her scent left there, bleached everything. You will never know that wisdom was in that person because they have gone away, around and blasphemed the Holy Spirit. Let that not be us. Come the Most High has given us the riches of the kingdom of heaven, but carnal men prefer carnal things. And so Akia will always be their covenant. They may smell Bequa and even, you know, frolic around with it. But they like, I love that earthly stuff. And earthly people love Akia. They prosper in it. They become wealthy in it. Uh, they become powerful and famous in it. And you may be wondering, why Why we can't? Mm. I sing just as good. I mean, I, I can do what he, she doing. I mean, but nobody want to hear you, though. <laughs> they want to hear them that are prominent in that covenant. Mm -hmm. All right? You are angelic, all right? Now, when the tables turn, in this earth, virtue has no value. But when the tables turn, those of us who are spiritual are going to shine like mega superstars, right. as said in Daniel, the 12th chapter. We're going to shine brighter than the sun. And those that were carnal are going to, once again, you know, be raking leaves in the east side of the garden. No prominence whatsoever. All right, let's read that. Wisdom of Solomon 2. Verse 23, for Abba created man to be immortal. This is how Abba created us in the beginning. Immortal, not carnal. Eating of Bequa, eating of that spiritual covenant of life, the tree of life. Read. And made him to be an image of his own eternity. Made him angelic and immortal like Abba is. Continue. Verse 24, nevertheless, through envy of the devil. Came now we understand what Solomon was saying. Envy of the devil. He envied the prominence of Adam. He envied that the Most High chose him and made a covenant with him. So through envy of the devil, what happened? Came death came into the world. Came death, came separation. Made or convinced Adam and Eve to eat of the tree that brings division to the Most High. All because he was envious. Adam did nothing to him. But because of his own thinking that he should have supremacy on creation, he said he's going to hate Adam and all of his offsprings. And you are an offspring of Adam, so he hates you. Don't try to make a contract. Don't make a dealing with him. Don't do anything with him. He hates you. Don't talk to the devil, Hasatan. Little thoughts come to your head. I don't want to deal with that. I deal with righteousness. I don't deal with that. I'm not engaged with Hasatan whatsoever. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Let's read on. Nevertheless, through envy of the devil came death into the world. And they that do hold of his side do find it. And they that hold on to that side. Not Bequa, but Achaia find just that, the fruits of a carnal covenant death. Mm. And the Most High sent forth the Messiah to consecrate a heavenly covenant for us. But we hated it. We hated it. And so we preferred a physical temple. Everything, phys everything about it was physical, lambs, rams, turtle dove. The Most High said, you dummies don't get it. You know what I'm going to do? 70 AD, I'm going to destroy your temple. And he destroyed the temple. And what did they do? They rebuilt it again. And the Most High destroyed it. And they rebuilt it again. And he destroyed it. And then he just scattered them all over the earth. And what are we doing today? Still trying to build a temple. God. We got people going back to Israel. I'm building a temple and making a sacrifice. <laughs> you are in Achaia and you are just as carnal as a tall mountain. And those of us who are spiritual in, cap in captivity, we don't have to go to Jerusalem. And you'll find out in a moment that Jerusalem is not the aim. Hello. That's not the place we ought to go. Come on. You know, studying animals, right? 
there's an octopus, right? He could be right there. And when something tried to grab hold on him, he just put out this ink. And whatever's trying to get him is all in that ink. Like, I got him. Yeah. I got him. And you look around, the octopus is a half a mile away. This is the same trickery that the Most High played upon them. Left a little piece of land that they thought was HQ, headquarters for the Most High. Yeah. Every nation on the earth fighting over the Most High. Like, that's, that, that was just a... Smoke that was just screen. a smoke screen, absolutely. <laughs> the real deal is in the real place, nobody's over there. And we're going to disclose it today, I'll be willing. And so that place was left barren, all right, less toxic. No man want to go there. No. It's inhospitable, and I love it. Because if it was lush, it would have all types of gay pride marches yeah. and wickedness going on over there, exploiting the minerals of the place. Remember, the Most High's house as we'll see, is right above this place. And you have to come under it like Adam and Eve, Seth and all the holy generation did offer oblation doxologies to the Heavenly Father. And he'll open his door. And he'll begin to take you up like Elijah was taken up. Like many great men were taken up. The Most High is showing us redemption is nigh. Nigh at hand. God. So man was made to be immortal through envy of the devil. We all died. Anybody that's part of his trickery you dead as well. We're going to go back to the second book of Adam and Eve. We're going to pick it up in the eighth chapter. And the very first verse. And as I said, Abba Willem, we're going to bring it uh, full circle to the fall of Adam and what we should be doing. <clears throat> go ahead and read it when you get it. And if you'll get Joshua, just hold Joshua 316. Second book of Adam and Eve, chapter 8, verse 1. When our father Adam saw that his end was near, he called his son Seth, who came to him in the cave of treasures, and said to him, O Seth, my son, bring thy children and thy chosen children, that I may shed my blessing on them ere I die. So Adam came to the end of his life, 930 years. And he wanted to tell them what the Most High told him so that they can carry on until the end of this curse. Read on. Verse 3, when Seth heard these words from his father Adam, he went from him, shed a flood of tears over his face, and gathered together his children and his children's children, and brought them to his father Adam. But when our father Adam saw them around him, he wept at having to be separated from them. And when they saw him weeping, they all wept together and fell upon his face, saying, How shalt thou be severed from us, O our father? And how shall the earth receive thee and hide thee from our eyes? Thus they did lament much and in like words. Then our father Adam blessed them all and said to Seth, after he blessed them, O Seth, my son, thou knowest this world that is full of sorrow and of weariness, and thou knowest all that has come upon us from our trials in it. I therefore now command thee in these words to keep innocency, to be pure and just and trusting in Abba, and lean not to the discourses of Satan. Lean not to the discourses of Satan. They mean you no good. You might as well never talk to them. Have none of that. Have nothing to do with these evil spirits. If you read the book of Adam and Eve and you don't get a little misty eyed, something wrong with you. Yeah. You may be stuck in the carnal covenant. Yeah. This right here hits you in the, in the heart. It's powerful. Yeah, Adam was, didn't want to be here killed himself on several occasions crying to be back with the most high and so he finally collected himself and said we are to do 7,000 years here let me equip you Seth and what you should do and what you should teach your children never talk to the devil hmm. you know we keep talking about we don't snitch we don't talk to police screw that we don't talk to Satan we have nothing to do with him whatsoever oh you're going to create vengeance on the person I don't like I don't even care I don't, I don't even want that either you don't mean me any good whatsoever. Let's read. Nor the apparitions in which he was showing. If you read the book of Adam and Eve, Satan was coming as friendly people. Mm -hmm. He was coming as family. He said, don't even do that. We don't judge by the flesh. We judge by the spirit, the fruit. You can be granny whoever. And, you know, looking all good with a basket of cookies, talking about, you know, I heard some gossip. You the devil. I don't want nothing to do with it, Granny. Coming over this house with some gossip. 
It's Satan. Once again, with apparitions, trying to get you into it. Read on. Verse 8. But keep the commandments that I give thee this day. Then give the same to thy son Enos, and that Enos give it to his son Canaan, and Canaan to his son Mahalalel, so that this commandment abide firm among all your children. Verse 9. O Seth, my son, the moment I am dead, take ye my body and wind it up with myrrhs, aloes, and cassia. And leave me here in this cave of treasures, in which all these tokens which Abba gave us from the garden. Now, Adam, once again, was in a physical place. He said, take my body, wrap it up, all right, because you're going to move it. You're going to put it someplace, and there's going to be a return to this place, as you'll see in a moment. Let's read. Verse 10. Oh, my soul, oh, my son, hereafter shall a flood come. All right, so now Adam is giving them prophecy. The Most High told them already there should be two destructions, one by fire and one by a flood. <clears throat> and so he's letting you know that the flood is coming first and the second one would be by fire. It's coming. And when this happened, the tenth generation on named Noah shall be there and my city shall be destroyed. Mm. The place where they were living was a city, a metropolis. A very, very plush, lush metropolis. Let's read. O oh, my son, hereafter shall a flood come and overwhelm all creatures and leave out only eight souls. But, O oh, my son, let those whom it will leave out from among your children at that time. Take my body with them out of this cave. And when they have taken it with them, let the oldest among them command his children to lay my body in a ship until the flood have been assuaged. So the Most High through Adam is saying, take my body and put it in that ark as well. You don't find that in Genesis, but you find it here. Take the body of Adam, the first man, for a reason. Let's read. And they come out of the ship. Verse 12. And they shall take my body and lay it in the middle of the earth. You shall take my body and come back to the middle of the earth, the navel of the earth, which we're going to cover in a minute. And you put it there. Now, rem I remind you that the book of Adam and Eve was translated by Christian scholars, and we're going to do our work at translating this as well. And so you'll see things like the Shabbat, you know, called Sunday or whatever, you know, those who have read it. But take it with a grain of salt what they're saying. All right, let's read on. Shortly after they have been saved from the waters of the flood. Verse 13. For the place where my body shall be laid is the middle of the earth. Once again, we're going to come back in another book, Jubilees and Jasher, telling you what the middle of the earth is. He said, come back here, just the leaders, not everybody, and put my body back in the middle of the earth, back on this holy mountain. Read. Abba shall come from thence and shall save all our kindreds. Ah, Abba's going to come back to this place and begin to save our offsprings. He's talking about the last days. He was on point with the flood. Certainly, he's going to be on point with the end days. Continue. Verse 14. But now, O Seth, my son, place thyself at the head of thy people. Tend them and watch over them in the fear of Abba. And lead them in the good way. Command them to fast unto Abba. And make them understand they ought not to hearken to Satan, lest he destroy them. Then again. Sever thy children and thy chosen's children from Cain's children. Do not let them ever mix with those. Mm. Remember Cain's children? A mark was placed upon Cain. And Job and Jeremiah said that mark is you won't ever get forgiveness. Ever. You can weep. You can cry. You can get on your knees. You can offer 10 billion oblation. There is no forgiveness for the children of Cain. And if you mix yourself with the children of Cain, there's a high probability that you won't find forgiveness either. Don't mix with them, is what he's saying. Read on. Nor come near them, either in their words or in their deeds. Verse 16. Then Adam let his blessing descend upon Seth and upon his children and upon all his children's children. He then turned to his son Seth and to Eve, his wife, and said to them, Preserve this gold, this incense, and this myrrh. Ah, preserve this gold because it is the golden altar and you burn incense upon it. Preserve it. You're going to need this in the latter days. Read. 
that Abba hath given us for a sign. This is the sign of that first covenant. All right, he's letting you know there's a sign. All right, an earthly sign of a golden altar was Adam's sign. Just like the rainbow was Noah and circumcision was Abraham's and the Sabbath was Moses. All of them had signs, but they all copied or had a resemblance of something that was in heaven. But let's read on. For in the days that are coming, a flood will overwhelm the whole creation. But those who shall go into the ark shall take with them the gold, the incense, and the myrrh, together with my body. All right, you keep this. Keep it together with my body, because in the last days, you're going to use it again. Read. And will lay the gold, the incense, and the myrrh with my body in the midst of the earth. Verse 18. Then, after a long time, the city. Ah, check this out. After a long time, at the end of 6,000 years, the city, the city that we were in, where you placed my body back, where we was at in the beginning. Read. The city in which the gold, the incense, and the myrrh are found with my body shall be plundered. Many thieves shall come in and gold robbers shall come in. Grave robbers and all types of people shall come in and plunder this city. They have. There's not a place on this earth that they didn't excavate and go in and looking for gold and gems and all manner of riches. And so the Most High said, but I outsmarted the smart. When you take my body back to where it was in the cave of treasure, they're going to come and they're going to rip and rob and they're looking for the Ark of the Covenant. God. You know, Indiana Jones, they're looking for it. The golden Rita. grail, the holy grail. Absolutely. Continue. But when it is spoiled, the gold, the incense, and the myrrh shall be taken care of with the spoil that is kept. Mosai said, I'm going to whisk it away, though. They may find some other things. That's cool. But this particular thing, the more principal point, I'm going to whisk it away and save it. Why is he doing that? Because we got a meeting with destiny. The Most High is saving it for his saints in the last days or what he said a long time to come back. As I said, you can go back over there break dancing, singing, or chilling, watching movies, doing that. That's not what you do with a golden altar. All right? You, you, you don't open up camp on the street corner and start yelling on a golden altar. If you don't know what is to be burnt on a golden altar, how to burn it on a golden altar, what to do with the horns and the base thereof, you don't know what to heave and to wave, you might as well stay away from it. Let's read. And not of them shall perish until the word of Abba made man shall come. Ah, until the word of Abba, we know the Messiah, made man shall come. And so now you're going to see a reflection of what he did in the fifth millennium taking part right now in the sixth millennium. He's going to again send forth his spirit. The exact same thing that happened in antiquity is going to happen in our day. The Messiah said in John, the things I do you shall do and greater worse than these because I go to the Father. This was once again a schoolmaster to show us what we was going to do. The Most High healed the sick not because he was healing all the sick in the land. That came to naught, right? People got yeah. more sick afterward. He did it to show you what you're going to be doing. He raised the dead to show you that you're going to do these things. And the same thing about the resurrection. He did that to show that you're going to rise up from the dead. Ezekiel 37 speaks about these dry bones, putting on sinews and ligaments and skin. And if you read the whole chapter, he says, in the covenant of David, they shall rise up a mighty strong army. And so... This here, the Messiah, he's talking about in our time. All right, let's continue to read. Call the verse. When king shall take them and shall offer to him gold in token of his being king. Check this out. When king priests shall arise, they're going to take this and begin to utilize the spiritual oblations unto the Most High in that ancient city where the body of Adam was secreted away. Noah himself took he was the head took the body back to where he was at nobody else Noah himself I would say his son Shem operated with him to go hide the body again so that the flood wouldn't damage it remember the flood covered all that area and if the body was there it would have been sogged out and moist mildew so he took it and then after 
Ham and Japheth was at the base procreating like rabbits. He took a journey right back to the great mountain, placed his body back, placed the altar, placed all those things back, and they came on back and began to build Sumar and the Akkadians and Mesopotamias, or what the Greeks call Mesopotamia, the first civilization post-flood. And so the Most High said, remember this place. It was here before Sinai. It was here before Mesopotamia. It was here before the Egyptians. It was here before all that biblical history you hear post-flood. It's a place that is superior to it. And the place that we know of as Israel and Jerusalem is a more modern thing. You know, that came later when we came out of the Egyptian captivity. And the Most High took us into the land of Canaan. And then we dwelt in uh, Canaan for about 500 years. And the Most High brought forth Saul. And then brought forth David and called it the city of David. That came later. Adam certainly wasn't in that place. Right. This is the place where the ark landed the second time. Mm -hmm. I mean, the ark landed. But we was in a superior place before that. And the Most High is prophesying that we go back. And we are going back. And not going back to sightsee. We're not going to be tourists. We're going back as natives. And we're going back to do what Adam and Eve were doing. What Seth and Enoch and Lamech and Noah were doing. It says that they were praising and worshiping the Heavenly Father, giving oblations, and they didn't want to do anything else. Carnal work was for men in the carnal covenant. Spiritual work was for men in the spiritual covenant. Let's read on, priest. Incense in token of his being with Abba of heaven and earth, and myrrh in token of his passion. Verse 19. Cold also as a token of his overcoming Satan and all our foes. Incense as a token that he will rise from the dead and be exalted above things in heaven and things in earth. All right. This is the sacrifice that happened in the sanctuary. There was a brazen altar in the outer court, but in the sanctuary was a golden altar right before the tree of life. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks was the son of man looking right at that golden altar. And he would put the blood on the horns and he would bring forth the fruit or the flowers from the tree of life and gently place it on the golden altar. And it says when it was burning, it came up before the Most High as a sweet-smelling savor in his temple. And this is what the saints will do in the last days at the right place at the right time with the right information and right knowledge, giving those oblations to the Most High. You won't be there saying, I don't eat pork. I do Leviticus 11. I don't have mixed garments. Most High don't want to hear that. That's for the carnal folk. You can do that anywhere on the planet. But when you come to the center of the earth also known as the navel of the earth under the most high it is your job to worship do what genesis 1 was all about you're either going to be in the covenant in heaven shemayim or the covenant in you the earth which one choose this day who you will serve carnal covenant the mosaic covenant is right here for you get to working buddy <laughs> but those of us who require a spiritual covenant come and submit yourself to that angelic covenant and the most high as prophesied would accept you back in it it was yours from the beginning. You devolved into carnality. It's time for us to ascend out of it. Let's continue, priest. Verse 20. And now, O Seth, my son, behold, I have revealed unto thee hidden mysteries, which Abba hath revealed unto me. Keep my commandments for thyself and for thy people. That's powerful. I've given you hidden mysteries that you're going to return back to this holy mountain in the last days. So it behooves you to search it out and try to find the coordinates of this city, the city of Adam, which is in Scripture. The same city that we're talking about is in Scripture. And we have chronicled it in this 2022, 20, 2023 calendrical study guide. It is the focus of it, the return home leaving the countries in which we were in exile, in diaspora, and returning back to the land of our nativity for one purpose, to stand in the stead of Adam and praise the Most High with the angelic Godhead. Let's read on, priest. Let's go to the next chapter, ninth chapter and first verse, and we'll try to speed through this. When Adam had ended his commandment to Seth, his limbs were loose. His hands and feet lost all power. His mouth became dumb, and his tongue ceased altogether to speak. He closed his eyes and gave up the ghost. But when his children saw that he was dead, they threw themselves over him, men and women, old and young, weeping. 
The death of Adam took place at the end of 930 years that he lived upon the earth on the 15th day of Bermuda. Now we find out the actual day that Adam passed away. When did he pass away? All right, on the 15th day of Bermuda, which is an Egyptian word. All right, this is an Egyptian month, but he's going to let us know exactly what it correlates with. Read. After the reckoning of an epact of the sun. After the reckoning of the vernal equinox. Mm. All right. So we see here, he died at the beginning of the year. At the beginning of the year, counting down his punishment. It didn't start at the middle or anything. At the epoch of the year, Bermuda, which is the beginning of our ecclesiastical year, the Most High set it forth by prophecy for him to do that. Read on. At the ninth hour. Check that out. Hmm. Ninth hour. Ninth lot. The same lot in which Yahweh was crucified. The name lot, the same lot that means salvation of the Most High. He passed away in that lot. We shall be saved in that lot. Come on. But we'll talk about that in the series even more. Much information. Much understanding that we need to utilize in these last days. Let's read on. Verse 4. It was on Friday. See, once again, so-called Christians translating the sixth day to their Friday. It was the sixth day. All right. Remember, we talked about that. Sixth day. Read. That very day on which he was created. The same day he was created in the sixth day or the sixth phase. And remember, he fell on the same day. And the Most High came in the cool of the morning, which would be what? Seven days, Shabbat. Genesis tell you that the Most High rested. It didn't say that he spanked Adam. It said he rested. He rested. You ever was a child and you did something wrong? Your mama's on the phone? Uh, you gonna get a beating after this phone come up. <laughs> You just like, oh, let me go to sleep. Maybe she'll forget it. And I, you, yo, and she come in there, wake you out of your sleep, beating you. Oh yeah. Same thing happened with Adam. He fell on the sixth day. Most I said the seventh day is Sabbath. I got you though. When the first day come around, I got you. He over there praying like maybe the Abba forgot. Maybe he forgot. Woo! It's over. It's good. Most I jacked him on the first day, but Mew Day at the vernal equinox and began his course at that point. All right, let's read on. And on which he rested and the hour at which he died was the same as that at which he came out of the garden. Mm. That's the point, the same hour he came out of the garden in the ninth hour. Of that sixth day he was created. The Most High put him in a carnal plane and physical bodies because he engaged in a physical sacrifice. Clear? as day. Let's finish this. Verse 5. Then Seth wound him up well and embalmed him with plenty of sweet spices from sacred trees and from the holy mountain and belayed his body on the eastern side of the of the inside of the cave. Alright. Much information about how he was buried in that cave. And once again, he talked about, take me out of this cave because the flood is going to come. I don't want my body to get jacked up. Put me in the ark. And when everything's settled down, come bring me back. Because in the last days, the saints going to come to this holy mountain and they're going to take the gold that was preserved here, even though this place shall be plundered. The Most High is going to secret away this gold and they're going to begin to take it, utilize it, and begin to offer those incense or spiritual offerings unto the Heavenly Father as it is in heaven. Read on the side of the incense and place in front of him a lampstand burning. Then you have the candlesticks. Once again, you have the golden altar, the candlesticks. And what do you have before the candlestick? Anybody? We have the tree of life. If anybody studied last year's calendar, it's all about the tree of life before the candlesticks of the Most High. And so they're eating. They have right to eat of the tree of life. Read on. Verse 6. Then his children stood before him weeping and wailing over him the whole night until break of day. Then Seth and his son Enos and Canaan and the son of Enos went out and took good offerings to present unto the Most High. And they came to the altar upon which Adam offered gifts to Abba when he did offer. But Eve said unto them, Wait until we have first asked Abba to accept our offering and to keep 
by him the soul of Adam, his servant, and take it up to rest. Adam's covenant was different than a lot of other covenants. There was no brazen altar. There was only the golden altar. And the golden altar alone, you offer incense to the Most High. All right? Not the physical on the brazen altar. This is what Adam was engaged in. This is what the Most High is bringing back. All right, we're going to slide over to the next chapter. All right, so they bewailed, bemoaned Adam. Another point I want to bring out is that when Adam passed, look at what they did. They offered gifts to the Most High, meaning sacrifices to Abba. They sacrificed on his behalf because he wasn't available to sacrifice anymore. And so this is what we should be doing for our elders and ancestors and loved ones who have passed away. We are remiss when we don't. And so when an offering is given in the seventh covenant, you have all right to say, my mother who have passed away, my father who is not here, and my brother and my son and my daughter who have passed away, may this oblation be on their behalf as it is on my behalf. This is the power that we have in our covenant. This is the power that they had in theirs. All right, let's slide to the ch uh, tenth chapter. Pick it up in the first verse. And Adam, when he had... And when they had ended their prayer, the word of Abba came and comforted them concerning their father Adam. After this, they offered their gifts for themselves and for their father. And when they had ended their offering, the word of Abba came to Seth, the eldest among them, saying unto him, O Seth, 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 three times, as I was with thy father, so also shall I be with thee, unto the fulfillment of the promise I made with him, thy father, saying, I will send my word and save thee and thy seed. I will send my word. And this is one thing I'm going to give you all a heads up on. When we break down Genesis, you'll find the word, the messenger of the Most High, Yahweh Shai, Christ, in Genesis 1. It's absolutely amazing. Just like what's written in John 1 and 1. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with the Most High. It's written in Genesis, but they wouldn't tell you that. Like they wouldn't tell you about the covenants. It's in the first verse. It is in the old so-called testament, covenant. But here the Most High is saying, I'm going to send the word, as I told you, and he's going to unveil to you what you need to do in the latter days to reach this mountain and to give the Most High the things he requires. Let's skip that, the rest of that chapter and pick it up in the 11th chapter as we begin to try to bring this class to a close. The second book of Adam and Eve, chapter, chapter 11, verse 1. After the death of Adam and Eve, Seth severed his children and his children's children from Cain's children. Cain and his seed went down and dwelt westward, below the place where he had killed his brother Abel. But Seth and his children dwelt northward up upon the mountain of the cave of treasures. So Seth and his children dwelt in that city of Adam northward and that glorious city that we're talking about that was eventually destroyed and they were righteous so righteous that the most high adopted them and called them his children let's read verse 3 and Seth the elder tall and good with a fine soul and a strong mind stood at the head of his people and tended them in innocence penitence and meekness and did not allow one of them to go down to Cain's children but because of their own purity, they were named children of Abba. And they were with Abba instead of the host of angels who fell. Now, what was the angels that fell? Anybody from everything we have gone through? There were some angels that fell. Anybody? Bohemoth and Leviathan? Right. Confederacy of angels, Casbiel, and all of them. They fell. And so, in that first century, the Most High said, take Adam's children through Seth and let them replace them. And so they were over the land and the water in the place of those who fell. And that just enraged Hasatan any, even more. And so the Most High called them his children and not the children of Seth. But the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they was fair. Not talking about angels, talking about Seth's children. Mm -hmm. And they began to lay with the children of Cain at the, the, at the base of the mountain. Once again, infusing their seed with a a, a group of people who had no covenant with the Heavenly Father and no chance of salvation. And the Most High said, y'all doing it again. That became the end of that holy city. 
and the beginning of the Most High starting all over with Noah and his three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and their wives, and a whole new city. Now, that city was utterly destroyed. Now, we're not going to read the rest. For those who haven't read, please read the rest of that. It's powerful. If you would, give me Joshua, third chapter in the 16th verse. If you'll give me that in Jubilees, in Joshua. That the waters which came down from above stood. Anybody know how Adam's city was destroyed? Anybody know how that city where Noah was at was destroyed? Anybody? By a flood, absolutely. The Most High destroyed. Now, where Noah was was called the city of Adam. So he destroyed the city of Adam with a flood. Now, when the children of Israel crossed the Jordan, going into the land of Canaan, people was fighting against them. And the Most High said, I'm going to do something against these cities. I'm going to treat them and destroy them like I destroyed your father Adam's city. Let's look at it. Let's read it again. That the waters which came down from above. Where did the waters come from that destroyed Noah's city? Heaven, absolutely. And the earth opened up as well. From above it came down. I mean above. What do you mean? From the clouds? No, past the firmament. They keep talking about, you know, going to outer space. All of that is a form of water. Water comes in different forms. You can have it in a liquid. You can have it in a gas. It could be a solid. But all of that while they're floating up there had nothing to do with gravity. If I go under the ocean and I start, I'm floating too. Gone. But it's all water above the firmament and it's water under the firmament. And so the most I cracked the firmament and a flood of water came into the earth and began to flood the earth flood the region and Adam's body was on that ship so technically it was like nine people it wasn't eight and Adam was there too but the most high brought that water in and then he opened the heavens and told it to go back out as well all right so he did the same thing to the city that was coming against Joshua and all the Israelites as they was going to claim their land the land of Canaan let's read it again that the waters which came down from above stood and rose up upon a heap very far from the city of Adam. Very far, in the proper translation, like the city of Adam. How many of you heard of the city of Adam? Hmm. The city of Adam, right in our face. And the Most High destroyed them with a flood, like he destroyed the city of Adam with a flood, which is the place where Noah was at. And everything that we've heard given to Noah to take my body and take this golden altar and take this myrrh and this frankincense and when you land on Ararat go ahead and let Ham go down and let Japheth go down but take your son Shem and bring him back to this mountain and put my body there and put a seal upon it because his children will come back at the end of 6,000 years and they're going to find this place and they're going to come under the heavens and begin to utilize this golden altar and praise the most high Let's talk about where this place is. The city of Adam, Joshua 3.16. Hidden from us. All these decades or millennium even. Mosiah is saying the return to the city of Adam. Where everybody is trying to go where? City of David. Yeah. I'm going over there, boy, Jerusalem. <laughs> Get my citizenship. You go ahead with that. You go ahead with that. And they're guarding that place. Mm -hmm. I mean, they guarding that place. You see the Ethiopians that have gone back? They're trying to deport them, giving yeah. them $3,000. Yeah, get up out of here. Over there. Races is all get out. You go over there, you don't own and can't own Jack. They watch it, everything. You go to the Temple Mount, you know, you, you got Islamic people there. You got the Catholic people. If they knew what a city of Adam was, I mean, uh, Adam was, like I said, it would be a Catholic temple right in the midst of it. Yeah mosque and all kind of paganism right at the doorstep of the heavenly father and so he kept it cloistered hidden until these days all right let's call what you got doc oh you ever done yeah Josh, the jubilees first but on it. all right uh this is the book of jubilees chapter 8 verse 12. all right once again jubilees 8 12 another venerated book that a lot of people on their at their own peril like to say it's not valid, but we have scoured this book and gone uh, back and forth to show that uh, it's validity. All right, let's go ahead and read what you got. Call that again. The book of Jubilees, chapter 8, verse 12. And there came forth on the writing as Shem's lot, the middle of the earth. 
Let's start at the 11 verse. And he called his sons, and they drew nigh to him, they and their children, and he divided the earth into lots. All right, Noah called his sons. Now check out the scenery here. This is post-flood. Noah's calling his sons together and saying, I'm going to divide the earth to all three of you. Go out and be fruitful and multiply. Let me give you your divisions. Let's read. Which his three sons were to take in possession, and they reached forth their hands, and took the writing out of the bosom of Noah their father. And there came forth on the writing as Shem's lot, the middle of the earth. Yeah, remember what the Most High told, uh, what Adam told his sons, put my body in the middle of the earth. All right, this came to Shem. All right, that whole land came to Shem and all of his offsprings. Let's read on. Which he should take as an inheritance for himself and for his sons for the generation of eternity. From the middle of the mountain range of Rapha. All right, we see now the middle of the range of Rapha, and we put a little bit of this in the 2023 uh, Calendrical Study Guide, talking about what they call Pangea. All right, have you ever heard of Pangea? It's talking about when all the continents were one, and that was a fact. In the beginning, the Most High called the waters together and the land together. Con. And at the flood, it not only cracked the heaven, but he said that was a tremendous earthquake, violently shook, and it began to pull apart the continents. But it was all one at one time, and Adam's homeland was right in the center of it. And we got some information on that in the midst of this calendrical study guide as well. All right, let's continue to read on. From the mouth of the waters from the river Tina. So we're talking about Rafa, which is talking about the Alps. So Shem's area was all the way north going into southern Europe. We're talking about during around Portugal and Spain and Switzerland, base around that. That's the northern border. And he's going to tell you that Japheth was above them. Everybody should know that Japheth inherited Europe. All right, and so he's telling you how far his land goes on the north side. Let's continue. And all that is that is to the north, and the, this flows into the great sea. All right, the river Tina is talking about Euphrates again. All right, it's uh, dealing with that land going toward India. And once again, we're going to go through this in depth in the series, breaking all of this down. Let's read on. And all that is toward the north is Japheth's. All right, and anything north of what Shem got is Japheth. All right, letting you know that that's Europe. He's getting not what they call Middle East. He's getting like Southern Europe all the way down. Read on. And that, and all that is toward the south belongs to Shem. And it's meaning south of Japheth's land. Continue. Verse 13. And it extends to the reaches Carasso. That is the bosom of the tongue which looks toward the south. All right, the bosom of the tongue which looked toward the south. There was rivers we're going to show in ancient maps. Everything that you see as the Sahara Desert was what was given to Shem. All right, why? The most I cursed the land of Adam, right? And said the ground shall be cursed. And he scorched that earth all the way across. And you can see it in Greece. It's still, you know, it's, it's like brackish. It's in the between. But it's still there. Portugal, Spain looked like that as well. And so that area right there was all given to Shem, his land for the most part. And we're talking about, it was Pangea, so to speak. I use their term. It was just one continent. We're talking about all the way west and all the way east completely. Not just that land, but every piece of land on this earth. East and west, everybody got theirs. So Japheth had everything in the north. We're talking about the Poles, Iceland. You know, Denmark, Sweden, all of that was given unto him. Let's read on. Verse 14. And his portion extends along the great sea and extends in a straight line to the reaches of the west. Now look at this. He says a straight line, and we're going to be proving and showing. Straight line, the boundary comes from the most high putting forth these equatorial lines or what they call equator absolutely or capricorn all of it the most high had it all stretched out this is not like a new european invention that didn't nobody knew about you know mapping until they came no the most high had a straight line adam's land was once on the equator hmm. and what happens on the equator lush plush vibrant every country on the equator is like jungles all over the place this used to be 
where the Sahara was. And anybody do any research on the Saharan Desert, they say about 2,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago, it was plush. They got a lake that they discovered over there, dried up, called Lake Chad or Mega Lake Chad, the biggest lake, freshwater lake on the earth. Hmm. They're discovering whale bones in the middle of the desert. Palm trees and all manner of animals and all. It's, it was just plush because that was, as you will discover here, this was Eden. The garden was the center where the Most High was at, but that whole west of Africa, you'll see, was Eden. All right, not Israel, West Africa. Let's read on. And he extends in a straight line to the reaches the west of the tongue which looks toward the south. For well, this sea is named the tongue of the Egyptian Sea. So now it's going all the way over to the Reed Sea or the Red Sea by Egypt. From the west going all the way east. And then Genesis tells you that it go past that all the way to the Euphrates. And then it go past the Euphrates as well. Is he going to tell you here into what is called India. Which are once again the children of Shem. But let's read on. Verse 15. And it turns from here toward the south. Towards the mouth of the great sea. All right, read this slowly right here. It goes to the south now. All right, his land is going, he's going to tell you the southern borders. He talked about the northern borders where Japheth was, right? Now he's talking about the southern borders of it. Let's read on. On the shore of his waters, and it extends toward the west to Afra. Ah, it go as far as the ends of the shore when you reach the ocean in Afra. Where's Afra? Hmm. Africa, absolutely. Named after Abraham's children. Uh, again, Afra. We're going to talk about that in the series as well. To the west coast of Afra, Africa. We're talking about Morocco, Mauritania. We're talking about all of that. Northwest Africa. The Most High is saying, here is Shem's land. Here is Eden. Let's read on. And extends to the west to Afra. And extends to the reaches the waters of the river Gihon. Now, he said, reaches all the way to Gihon. Remember in Genesis, to speak about Pison, Hedekel, Gihon, these four rivers. Same river. He's saying the west is right there. Gihon is right there in Africa. Remember, this was one continent at one point. And so a river was right there. And we're going to talk about that river Gihon and what became of it. Let's finish that verse. And to the south of the waters of Gihon, to the banks of the river. Okay, so there was a river at the bank. Now we're dealing in Africa, river Gihon furthest to the west. Hmm. Pangea, I use their term for, you know, the lack of a, we have in our own term, a continent was together. But when the Most High split it, let's get that, if you will. The Most High began to split it. Gihon was once a river. But Gihon, and do we have that chart, Priest Azaria? The so-called Pangea? We don't have it? That's all right. We got it in the calendar. You want it? The suspense is there. Go get it. All right. We show the continents all together in all four rivers. All right? All four rivers. All right. Let's get what we get. Uh, got in Jasher talking about Gihon. What became of Gihon? Jasher chapter 2, verse 1. And it was in the hundredth and thirtieth year of the life of Adam upon the earth that he again knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bare son in his likeness and in his image. And she called his name Seth, saying, Because Abba hath appointed me another seed in the place of Abel, for Cain hath slayed him. And Seth lived one hundred and five years and begat a son, and Seth called the name of his son Enos. Saying, because in that time the sons of men began to multiply and to afflict their soul and hearts by transgressing and rebelling against Abba. And it was in the days of Enos that the sons of men continued to rebel and transgress against Abba to increase the anger of the Most High against the sons of men. And the sons of men went and they served other deities and they forgot the Most High who had created me mm. them in the earth. In those days, the sons of men made images of brass and iron, wood and stone, and they bowed down and served them. And every man made his idol, and they bowed down to them. And the sons of men forsook the Mosai all the days of Enos and his children, 
and the anger of the Most High was kindled on account of their works and abominations which they did in the earth. Mm. Verse 6. And the Most High caused the waters of the river Gihon to now, overwhelm them. the same them. river that they said going past the boundaries in Africa, Gihon is there. All right, so we got these four rivers, Gihon, Pison, Hittikil, and the Euphrates. The Euphrates is talking about the we, uh, the eastern side, and it goes past the Euphrates. It's just a, a landmark. He said that's on the eastern side. Now, Gihon, past Africa, is the western side. All right. And so now we see in these days when they came down, they was uh, accustomed to Gihon. They knew what it was, these, these saints that began to get wicked. All right, read on. Same chapter, move on. You want me to read the same chapter? Verse uh, Jasher chapter 2 verse 6 And the Most High caused the waters of the river Gihon to overwhelm them And he destroyed and consumed them And destroyed the dirt, third part of the earth And notwithstanding this The sons of men did not turn from the evil ways And the hands were yet exalted to do evil In the sight of the Most High You can read or move on to the next chapter all right, so the Most High caused this, the sons that was in that holy city, the Gihon swelled his banks and showing them an indication that was to come, a flood. All right, let's go to the other chapter. Jasher chapter 10, verse 1. And Peleg, the son of Eber, died in those days, in the 48th year of the life of Abram, son of Terah, and all the days of Peleg were 239 years. All right, so anybody that know what Peleg is, this is uh, Noah having his son Shem, our fact sad, that holy generation came through. This is post-flood. All right, let's read on. Verse 7. And these are the sons of Japheth according to their families, Gomer, Magog, Medai, Javan, Tubal, Meshach, and Tyrus. These are the children of Japheth according to their generations, and the children of Gomer according to their cities. Where the Frankum, who dwell in the land of Franza, by the river Franza. Now they're talking about all of Japheth's offspring. Sound very familiar to some of the names today. We're not going to get into it, but we want to bring out uh, what's in the scope of our discussion. Read. Verse 9. And the children of Raphat are the Bartonim, who dwell in the land of Bartonia, by the river Lada, which empties its waters in the great sea. Gihon, that is Oceanus. Now there in this time, Gihon has stretched unto a ocean. So when you have the Pangea effect, they all come together, it was a river. But when North America and South America split from Africa, it went from Gihon to the Atlantic Ocean. All right? The Gihon is the Atlantic Ocean. All right? The most I split the continents at that point. And I'll give you heads up. The Most High is talking about bringing it all back together. I'm this on. was part of the flood. This was part of the curse. When in the sixth millennium it says an earthquake shall come that has never been on this earth. Meaning bigger than the earthquake that happened during the time of Noah. It took less energy to break it. It's going to take more energy to bring it together again. And the Gihon shall be there again. Hmm. I, uh, I got that scripture. Uh, Jasher chapter 6. Um, verse 8 And Noah brought forth into the ark From all living creatures that were upon the earth So there was none left but Noah brought into the ark Two and two came to, the, to Noah in the ark But from the clean animals and clean fowl He brought seven couples as Abba had commanded him And all the beasts and all the animals and beasts and fowls were still And they surrounded the ark at every place and rain had not descended till seven days after. And on that day, the Most High caused the whole earth to shake. Mm. During the days of Noah, before the flood came, there was what? The Most High caused the whole earth to shake. Violently shake. Earthquake tremendously because he's moving the continents at this point. And, of course, the waters came down. And so to make room for the waters as well is that these oceans were being made. All right, let's read on. And the sun darkened, and the fountains of the world raged, and the whole earth was moved violently. And the lightning flashed, and the thunder roared, and all the fountains of the earth were broken up. 
such as was not known to the inhabitants before. And Abba did this mighty act in order to terrify the sons of men that there might be no more evil upon the earth. The earth was moved. Mm. The continents moved. All right, you can look over to Gihon and see where New York City was to be. You can look over and see North Carolina, Virginia, Georgia, standing on the continent of Africa, taking a little raft right on over. Uh, I mean, where Georgia's going to be at. Yeah. Now, let me go back to Mauritania. The most high split the earth. Gihon was the Atlantic. Or it is the Atlantic, I should say. And so now, we began to see where Shem's land was. His land went past the Gihon. We're going more west now. We're going toward the Garden of Eden. If we can go back to Jubilee, where you were, priest, and we can begin to finish that up. All right. Uh, hey, you have on, more? You have yeah, more yeah. Uh, All right. The book of Jubilee, chapter 6, and um, starting the 24th verse. And Noah ordained them for himself as feasts for the generations forever. So they had become thereby a memorial unto him. On the new month of the first month, he was bidden to make for himself an ark. And on that day, the earth became dry, and he opened the ark and saw the earth. And on the new month of the fourth month, the mouths of the, of the depths of the abyss be, beneath were closed. And the new month of the seventh month, all the mouths of the abysses of the earth were open, and the waters began to descend into them. So now we see the abyss, Oceanus, Gihon, the firmament open, and the waters from heaven began to be a part of this violent shaking and moving of the earth. The oceans were made at this point. The Most High made it because of the disobedience of man. Now what we're going to bring in is one of the charts that we have in the calendar. It is what they call um, Pangea. But it is the earth as it was in the beginning. Now, obviously, we don't have it in-house right now, but those who are watching online, you see that. You begin to see that one continent. You begin to see where North America is and South America perfectly hugging the west coast of Africa, fit together like a hand in glove. And then you see the north that was given to Japheth, all of what became known as Europa or Europe. They named their country after their gods. All right, Scandinavia, Russia, all of that belonged to Japheth. But when you look past or north of the Pison, which is now the Mediterranean, you begin to see the land that was given to Shem. And passing Gihon, you see the Americas. All of that was given to Shem and his children. Now, south of the city of Adam was given to Ham. Ham ran, ruled that area for a thousand years before the flood. And so Ham created great cities. Slide right on over Ham's little land and where you end up, South America, right? Mm -hmm. Anybody ever heard of the Olmecs? The Olmec people? Ah, now you see where they come from. That's all they found was their ruins. But they got these big Africanoid heads Big nose, lips yeah, like eight yeah. foot wide, Son. nose big. That was Ham's territory. We're talking about an equator going left and right. We're not talking about little pieces like they cut up land today. The Most High went off the equator or the, what they call Capricorn or whatever. And so part of Ham's land, he was building up pyramids. He had the Olmec people. These were Ham's children, which we were in good relationship with. All right, and so they was building that up. When the flood came, they was pretty much wiped out with everything else and told to, um, I would say that these are the people, not Ham. Ham wasn't even born at that time, but these are the people that ruled in the area of Ham, all right, that would be given to Ham. And the same thing for the ruins you may find in where Japheth's territory. These were people that was created in Adam's time during Sh uh, Shem's reign, Enoch's reign, the people at the bottom of the valley was going out populating these areas and the flood wiped them out and the populations that will come later will simply build on their ruins. All right, this is how it was in the beginning. So the Mediterranean was called Pison. Gihon would become known as the Atlantic Ocean and Gihon surround the whole land of Ham or Cush as mentioned in the Bible. All right, Cush in the Bible 
is it well Ethiopia is a Greek word labeled on Cush, some of the, one of the uh, sons of Ham. It says that it encompasses the whole land. So you look at Gihon, it goes all the way down to what is now known as South Africa. And look at Hittikil. Hittikil would be the red or the reed sea. All right, going all the way down, and that would be like the Indian Ocean, or was the Indian Ocean before it came together. And then Euphrates also was an outlet to it as well. Once again, though, we're going to be talking about this in the series, all right, bringing out all the specifics on it, showing you that the earth was of one land mass. And if you go from east to west, from what is called the Alps of Switzerland, that was Japheth's, I mean, that was, north of that was Japheth, and below that was Shem. All the way down to Ham's land, Sub-Sahara was given unto Ham. Everything in between was given unto Shem. All right. Let's drop that. Let's go back to where you were in Jubilees. I believe the 8th chapter. Jubilees. Jubilees chapter 8, verse 16. And it extends toward the east till it reaches the Garden of Eden. All right. Now we see here that they went all the way west to the boundaries, going all in what is now called the Americas. Some people... Anyway, we'll talk about it a little in the series. <laughs> Don't want to let too much out. But it goes west, very, very west. Now, coming back east... We're talking about the Garden of Eden. When you pass the Gihon, pass over that river, you're stepping back into the Garden. Now, it's two places, right? The Garden is in the middle of Eden. Eden is that whole western side of what is called Africa. All right? Eden is that whole western side. The Garden is in the center. It is where the Most High dwells. It is called the Holy of Holies. All right, he dwell in the heavens above it, I should say. All right, let's read on. To the south thereof, and from the east of the whole land of Eden, and of the whole east, it turns to the east and proceeds till it reaches the east of the mountain named Rapha, and it descends to the bank of the mouth of the river Tina. All right, so he's saying, keep going east. You was at the furthest west. You came back to Gihon, keep going east, and you're going to reach the Euphrates, also called Tina. And you're going to keep going. Read on. Verse 17. This portion came forth by Lot for Shem and his sons, and they should possess it forever unto his generation forevermore. And Noah rejoiced that this portion came forth for Shem and for his sons, and he remembered all that he had spoken with his mouth in prophecy, for he had said, Blessed be the Most High, Abba of Shem, and may the Most High dwell in the dwelling of Shem. Noah was happy because he once lived in the city of Adam. He's saying, my son Shem got Adam's city. He was happy. Hmm. Japha got the north, Ham got the south, but he was like, Shem is my favorite. And he cast lots, prayed unto the Heavenly Father, and Ham, which one you want? Ham scuttled for the south. Japha went toward the north. Shem was like, I'll take whatever. Took the middle, and blessed was he. He was to inherit the city of Adam. Let's read on. Verse 19. And he knew that the Garden of Eden is the Holy of Holies. He knew that the Garden, not Eden, Garden. And anybody know anything about the temple? There's the outer court. Is it holy? Absolutely it's holy. But is there some holy of all things holy? Absolutely. It's the center. It is in the sanctuary. It is up the winding steps. It is where the Most High Ark of the Covenant dwells. And you go there in the Day of Atonement to talk to the Most High. And so in this whole realm of Eden is a garden where the Most High sits above it and talks to Adam. If we would have read on with uh, the children of Shem, which time would not permit, it says that they was under that mountain smelling the fragrances that will come out of heaven. They heard the angels sing. They would see angels coming back and forth, running the errands on behalf of the Most High. They was right there in the garden. And the Most High loved them so much, he converted them and said, come on up here. I know I said I wasn't going to let Adam in, but I'm going to let y'all in. He let them in for a moment. But let's continue to read on about this place. And the dwelling of the Most High, and Mount Sinai, the center of the desert. Let's read that again. Jubilee chapter 8, verse 19. 
And he knew that the Garden of Eden is the Holy of Holies and the dwelling of the Most High. Can, can, can you digest that? <laughs> I almost can't digest it. <laughs> that the Garden of Eden, this place where Adam was, above it is the dwelling of the Most High. All through scripture, you keep hearing about where the Most High don't dwell. He don't dwell in temples made with hands. Yeah. He ain't in your house. He ain't in your church. He ain't there. He ain't there. He ain't there. Where is he? He's in the garden, the place where Adam was. And if you go there, you're standing at his doorstep. Mm. The Most High is there seeking. You shall find him. And if you knock at his door, he might answer it mm. and open up and may invite you in. This is the charge that was given to us in these last days. It is the dwelling of the Most High. The garden in that eastern part of Africa called Eden. Let's read. And Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai is completely on the eastern side. What is Mount Sinai? The same mountain Moses went up. The same mountain that they got that Achaia, that earthly covenant. What about Mount Sinai? The center of the desert. All right. The center of the desert, that desert part over there. Meaning... Mount Zion, the garden in Eden, is the center of the earth. The backyard of it is Sinai. The backyard of it is what they call Israel today. Now, that's important. It's part of Shem's land, but it sure ain't the front yard. All right? Mm -hmm. You may not cut the grass in the backyard. And neighbors won't complain. You don't cut it in the front yard. They may call the homeowners association on you. All right, meaning that Zion is more important important than Sinai okay Adam was there and after the flood the most high took the ark away where way, way over there to Sinai took him to Arawat they came down and eventually Moses went up atop Sinai all right so we're talking about a whole eastern part of his land let's read that part again Julie chapter 8 verse 19 and he knew that the Garden of Eden is the Holy of Holies and the dwelling of the Most High. And Mount Sinai, the center of the desert. And Mount Zion. Here it is. Mount Zion, which is that mountain under the garden, the physical mountain under the garden, a resemblance of the garden. What about it? The center of the navel of the earth. These three were created as holy places facing each other. Mm. Mm. So much meat there. I don't even know we can digest it all. All right. Mount Zion and Sinai, straight line facing each other. All right. One is on the west. One is on the east. All right. One is in the center of the desert on the east. One is on the west, which is the navel of the earth. Now, when you have a navel, it's because a placenta was attached to it. Why? The mother was feeding you everything you need. Adam was in the navel of the earth and the Most High was giving him everything he need. The saints shall return to the navel of the earth and the Most High shall give you everything you need. It shall be as in Sinai. We didn't work for Jack. We didn't want anything, even though the lay of us wanted to go back to Egypt and eat leeks and melons and all of that. The Most High is saying, if you come back to the navel of the earth, I will feed you angels food from heaven. Don't work. Don't do any of that. I'm going to feed you. I'm going to take care of you. That's all you have to do is grow like a baby. Mm. Build and grow. Don't be aborted. Do what Abba wants you to do in the navel of the earth. And we have the navel of the earth. If you would, I don't know if you have it, priest. Oh, you got it. All right. We're going to begin to show you the, <laughs> the absolute fundamental focus of this calendrical study guide. The navel of the earth. Some may call it the eye of Africa. Some may even call it the Rekot structure. But the Bible, in the Bible, they call it the navel of the earth. Not only because it looked like a navel, but because the most I fed the children of Adam there. Let's bring up the image. This right here, brothers and sisters, is called the Rekot structure. It is in Mauritania. This is a real Na picture. This is a real oh, yeah. picture. This is not digitized or anything. This is here today. You can go on Google to look it up. It is in modern city of Mauritania. It is the south of the Atlas Mountains, south of Morocco. This is in West Africa, in the Sahara Desert right now. 
this is the place where Adam, Seth, Enos, Enoch, Lamech, and Noah was at. This place has all kind of, uh, of archaeological evidence revealing that it was washed away by a flood. All right, Washed away completely, but the foundation is still there. In the Bible, it describes a city that looks just like that. In Ezekiel, it literally described this circular city. But I'm going to give you a heads up. At the flood or post-flood, Shemham and Japheth was taught by Noah. And all of the Japheth societies and the Hemetic societies and the Shemetic society taught of this great city. First, we have the Akkadians or uh, Sumer or the Mesopotamians as the Greek called it. They talked about a previous city. But now you got all these people mystifying, you know, talking about all kind of other stuff. But it says that they were like gods in this place. Mm. It said that they had all types of modern technology flying and whisking around in the sky. They had all types of energy that have not been seen on the earth. Power in the earth to move things. This is the city of Adam. You have the Egyptians talking about a great city and taught one of the Greek philosophers, Plato, his elders about this city. Plato took it and said they called the city Atlantis, hmm. a city of circular rings and three concentric circles. And there was 10 kings. Why 10 kings? Why did he say 10 kings? Because Adam had 10 generations. Come on. They talking about the sons of Adam that reigned in that city. And he talked about how they were pious and glorious in righteousness, but because of corruption in the last city, their God brought a flood and drowned Atlantis buried it this was the city of Adam this is the city of our home it is not some fanatical place in the you know Bermuda somewhere it is on the west coast of Africa it is our place and the most High is now calling us home there is embedded in the mountains a golden altar for us to take not to go sell on the black market it's for us to offer oblations unto the most high the most high has been training us showing us how to baptize how to anoint how to atone and get sin off of you. How to give peace and thanksgiving offerings because you're going to need to do that when we return back home. As I started from the onset, saluting all the camps, I'll end it with this. The saints are preparing to return back home. The great grand exodus that was prophesied has already begun. We're going to end the class on that and we're going to promote the series that is coming out. Executive Priest Yara Dunn is going to show you, talk to you about some of the uh, channels and what we have, where we're going to be talking about this in depth. This was not in depth. This was general. We're going to be talking about in depth, in all types of information, understanding that was not brought out because this would be more like an 8, 12-hour class, and we can't do that. This is the Feast of Weeks, the 50th day. It's time to celebrate the Most High for blessing this gift upon us. Gifts from heaven. This is equivalent to speaking in many languages. He spoke in a language I can understand. Yeah. It's time to go home. All right. You want to bring it up? Con, um, most I willing, we're going to be launching a new YouTube channel dedicated just to this, the city of Adam. That's how powerful and impactful it is. So the link for that is in the description of this video and in the chat. We definitely want everybody to go to that channel, subscribe to it, share it, like it, uh, share all that around to spread the message of the return to this great city. It's prophesied that the saints will come back and the Most High will shift the earth. There will be a great earthquake once again and that land will be restored from a great desert into a plush, beautiful garden like it once was. So to do that, we have to fulfill our part. We have to come together, get in this covenant, offer oblations and sacrifices, and excel and increase in knowledge as it's prophesied to do. So to increase that knowledge, definitely share this video like and subscribe to the house of wisdom the main channel but also go to the city of adam channel like and subscribe share that so you, we can all be partakers of what's coming down the line and also definitely get a calendrical study guide that has all to do with the city of adam that's themed on the city of adam now even in this calendrical study guide it only has a bit and the pieces of the knowledge that the holy spirit of wisdom is bringing out
So get the full of it. You definitely need to subscribe to that channel and share it, post it, watch it, turn on notifications so that you can get all the knowledge that Most High Willing we're going to be bringing forth throughout uh, that channel throughout the coming weeks, Most High Willing. Absolutely. And, um, you know, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about what is the most high, some of the stuff that we're going to be bringing out, I'll be willing, in that series. The Akkadians spoke about the power that was in that place. And that power reached out to all places on that continent. There are places on this earth that they call the vile vortices. If you look it up, you'll begin to see that these are places that just don't make sense in science. One of the major ones is the Bermuda Triangle. You know, you go over there with compasses, they just spin out of control. Planes go over there, just turn up missing. Ships go by, just disappear. All types of strange stuff has been happening there since the beginning. But if you follow the Bermuda Triangle, I wish we could bring that up, but we can't. If you follow the line of Capricorn, which the city of Adam, the recot structure, the navel of the earth, exactly across, you begin to see the Bermuda Triangle. Showing you that when the Most High split the continents, he also moved the heavens as well. The heavens went to the left and the earth went to the right. And so when he bring that again, it's going to be properly aligned. But these vile vortices, what they call vile vortices, were actually portals of power that they had. And from these portals of power, energy, sustainable energy from the earth and from the heaven was dispersed all over the earth. And this is coming back. And so imagine at that city, the Most High has given the saints the power to energize any mechanism, new vehicles, new technology, all of that. And you begin to see the waning of you know, petrocarbons and gas engines and all of that. New things being built by this new energy that was here from the beginning that the Akkadians said caused them to fly. And they was building major structures just by energy. That's coming back. And with that energy in righteousness, the saints shall control the earth. The scriptures tell you that. Is that if in that case, energy is coming from the navel of the earth, and let's say that the Moabites turned around and said, you know, you know I, I'm tired of sending out tights to the navel of the earth. I don't want to do that no more. Well, we're going to cut off your light bill. Simple as that. All right, we're going to cut your energy off. We're not going to send a troop out there. All right. You want to go back to horse and buggies? From flying through the air, building through energy. You want to go back to horse? Go back to horse and buggy then. And the scriptures tell you that if they don't bring their tithe, rain shall not come. They won't have rain. They won't have any. Everything will be out of whack in their continent. Now, I know it sounds like fantasy, but it is written, and we're going to prove it. Just like the Bermuda Triangle sounds fantasy to people. These vowel vortices is not explained by science. You can trust in science. You can trust in the Most High. When everything realigns, the saints shall have authority over the energy like Adam did. And it will come through us acquiescing to the Most High. If we stop giving oblation, then the energy stop on us. Yeah. Most High said, you want your power off. And he cut our power off. And give it to someone else. This is what's coming to the earth. So not to give everything, the Most High is preparing to position his saints with hegemony and power over his whole creation. Genesis 1 is about worshiping the Heavenly Father. We didn't do it. We fell into despair. Now he's bringing us back. We now know what it is to be in Bequa, and we know what it is to be in the key of being the covenant in heaven and the covenant in earth. It's time for us to prefer the heavenly Adamic covenant and never again return to a carnal covenant. We're going to end the class on that, and we're going to open it up for anybody who have any questions. I pray that the Most High give us answers. I know it was a lot of information to digest. That's why we thought it, by way of the Spirit, befitting to do a series on this. So we may stay in Genesis 1, for maybe, you know, three classes. That's how deep it is, breaking down the whole Genesis 1 in Hebrew and then showing you exactly what transpired. We may deal with two classes on the fall. And then the city of Adam is definitely, all the details is just amazing. I don't know how long we'd be on that. All right, anybody have any questions that are in the midst right now, in the presence? All right, we'll start right here. 
Uh, let's get somebody with a mic. Praises. That was just. I mean, I don't even know how to All praises. All praises to Abba. Why yeah? I knew it was coming, sis. <laughs> <laughs> My mind is blown. Um, so I'm definitely going to have more questions after I review God, this again God. and again and again and watch the series. But for right now, my initial question is, and forgive me if I missed it, but did you mention Havilah? You know, like we're in Genesis two eleven, where it says uh, the name of the first is it's Pison or Pison, that it is it which compasseth the whole land of Havilah. Right. Did you mention the land of Havilah, not the river, right? Right. The right. land of Havilah. So which... Havilah, actually. All right. Let's go to it in Genesis two, if you will. What do you want, 11? Start at 10. 10. And the river went out of Eden, and a river went out of Eden to water the garden. And from thence it was parted and became into four heads. All right, so he's talking about this river coming out of Eden, which is West Africa, right? Mm -hmm. And so it was rivers, when you read in Ezekiel that this temple that they set up, it says that there was rivers going right under it. And right. waters began to get deeper. And it speaks about these three divisions which Plato talked about these three concentric rings, and it actually went into the Gihon. And the Gihon is connected with four rivers, is what it's saying. Mm -hmm. It's not saying that it sprouted out like in Egypt, you'll see heads all over the place. It's mm -hmm. just saying that it has three, uh, four divisions to it. Let's read on. 11. And the name of the first is Pison, right? That so we see Pison, you look on the map, it is the, what they call today the Mediterranean, or in the Bible, the Great Sea. All right, so part of it went toward Pison. Read on. Um, that is which compasses the whole land of Havilah. All right, and so you see that land Havilah. And so we didn't talk about the land. We're going to talk about it in the series as well. But that Havilah is like North Africa actually going over to the Iberian Peninsula, which is Spain, southern part of, uh, southern part of Spain. And so that is that land there. And so it's saying that that encompass it it all went, across, it went uh, around, around it around yeah okay okay let's read on it says uh, where there is gold all right and so a lot of gold was there for the reason that Adam talked about give the most high his offerings read on and the gold of that land is good there is uh, bedillium and onyx stone all right and so they used all of this in the city of Adam and they also had this special material called orichalcium all right, and this was used in the temple or around the temple, and Plato and the Samaritans talked about it encompassed great power. It was something that was only found there. You know, and I know I've mentioned this. <laughs> uh, I don't know if I'm digressing, talking about, uh, anyway, we'll move on. <laughs> but special energy, special material that was held there, and they utilized it. But let's read on. Uh, the name of the second river is Gihon. The same is it that compasses the whole land of Ethiopia. So we talked about Gihon, that river that was stretched and made the Atlantic, which encompassed the whole land of Ethiopia, biblical name Cush. That's what the Greeks put upon Cush, which is the land of Ham. And that's why on the map you see the Gihon going the Atlantic Ocean all the way down to what is now called South Africa. Now, on the east side of Africa would be that Hittikil, the Red Sea, going into the Indian Ocean and coming all the way down to South Africa. Let's read on. And the name of the third river is Hedekiel. That is it which goeth towards the east of Assyria. All right, so it is it that is on the east side of Africa continuing on to Assyria. And so that would be called, the Red Sea is not his name. All right, it's not red at all. It was called the Reed Sea hmm. because it had a bunch of reeds in it, all right? A bunch of seaweed. And so in mistranslation, they took an E off and it's, oh, it's Red Sea now. But it's talking about Hittikil. That was Hittikil on the eastern side of Africa going over into the, what is now called the Middle East. Let's read on. And the fourth river is Euphrates. All right, and the fourth, everybody know Tigris and Euphrates, the two rivers going into 
uh, Iraq and all of that area. Also connected with what is called TINA. Mm -hmm. And we're going to prove that in the series as well, going all the way over into India. All right, so good point, okay. sis. They were talking about the lands that they all encompass. And so that would be Shem's land as well. Right. Have a lot. Okay. What was given to Shem? Absolutely. Gotcha, gotcha. gotcha. And so this picture here that we're looking at on Con. the screen, so what's the, the genesis? Like, what, how did you come to that? All right, that's not ours. All right, we actually, you know, we embellished on it and whatnot. This is Plato's rendering of the city of Adam. But it is written in the Bible, and it looks just like this. It speaks about, once again, the three concentric circles, and in the middle you'll find a temple, a golden temple, where the priestly class worship the heavenly father in the second ring the priest dwell and in the third ring you began to see where uh all the congregation was at and they would all bring their sacrifices to the sons of adam in the middle of that that ring once again it got contorted and and mangled up and called atlantis now everybody think it's a uh a fairy tale yeah, absolutely yeah. it's actually the city of adam and the city of atlantis atlas You'll find in Morocco, the Atlas Mountains, right around Morocco, right around uh, Mauritania, right by the navel of the earth. They used to call the Straits of Gibraltar Atlantis, the gateway to Atlantis. Letting you know that the city of Adam, they remember, it was there. They only heard tales of it because the flood wiped everybody out. And those men that was there told their offspring about this great city that they once dwelled in. All right, so this is a rendering of that city that Adam dwelt in that we're going back to. And if you contrast and compare that to what is called the Recot structure, you begin to see, wow, it does look like this that has been washed away by a flood. And the Heavenly Father left that sign in the earth for the saints to return. All right, so, all right, that's it on that. Okay, one on. last question. Right. So now when you say we're returning back there, like, can you give me a little bit more context? Like, you said it's already started, Oh, yes. Just talking about it is the start of it. And okay. as I said before, the Most High has never given us anything that he wants us to sit back and gawk at. If he gave us the Ten Commandments, he wants you to do the Ten Commandments. Right. All right? The true Ten Commandments. He wants right. you to engage in these high holy days. If he gave you the Seventh Covenant, he wants you to consecrate and enter into it. If he gave you oblations, do it. He gave us this. Not to gawk at, but to prepare to enter into it. And now, since you asked that, I'll talk about it. Remember I said that so-called Bermuda, when it was... Pangea, so to speak, sat on top of it. And when the Mosai separated it, Bermuda is actually that heavenly place where the Mosai is at. All right? But a physical landmass is what he told us to go to and meet him over there. He's going to bring everything back together. Now, I don't want to complicate things because I didn't go through it, but I'm letting you know all of that weird stuff, magnetism and lightning. I saw a video where a guy said he flew through it and he survived the Bermuda Triangle. He was like, it was weird. I saw lights. I saw figurines moving, and I saw a portal closing. I said, I got to get up out of here. And he pushed the plane as fast as he can go, and he barely made it out, and he said he saw the portal close up. Mm. There is a gateway right there. And the Most High is saying, he don't want us to just go. That's not where we are supposed to go. We're supposed to go back to the place where he said, where Adam was, and he'll meet us there. The prophecy said, go back to Mauritania. Not Mauritania, but the navel of the earth, modern-day Mauritania. And so the Most High is actually telling us, like Moses was doing or Joshua was doing, what did he do? He sent out an envoy. He sent out, like, go out there, spy out the land. Check it out. Go check it out. Give up some oblations. Then come back and report and tell us what's going on. This is what we have to do. It is our, it, the, the onus is upon us to prove everything we're talking about, and the Most High is definitely putting it together. That the saints will return, offer oblations in that place, and wait on instructions from our Abba. Mm. Uh, and so in the spirit of that, um, with the wisdom, have we been provided with any logistics or any preliminary logistics? Well, we are in the process of trying to bring that together right now. Absolutely. Okay. So okay. we're bringing minds together to make this happen. Yeah, we have it. We have the power to do it. And I love that so, you know, so-called Mauritania more Ritania, because this place where the Moors were, like Morocco, is a essentially a third world country. I love it. It's beat down, it's barren. You know, <laughs> if it was if it was you know France or something, I mean, like, oh, you got a COVID test, you, right. you go take a shot, and you, mm -hmm. you ain't coming over here. Moses saying nobody's over there. You know, get yourself together. Y'all can make this happen. 
And so we're in the process of logistically putting that together, getting our tangibles together to make it happen. So you've got a passport. Right? You may be at, uh, be a part of this, this mission that we're moving ahead on. Yes, a little way, yeah, definitely. Thank you. And so as I said, we're not talking about just metaphorically. The Most High has kissed spirituality with carnality and brought it all together. Everything we've been doing up until this point is for a purpose that we couldn't even see. We were like Abraham walking in the land of Canaan. We was discouraged at time. People saying, sacrifice done away with, brother, you ain't got to do it. We just kept along like yeah. Abraham. Now the Most High said, I wanted you to do that because I'm about to take you to a place where you're gonna do it in glory. And it's gonna cause an immediate change. All right, so all you priests, I encourage you to enhance what the Most High has given you. It may be that we are giving oblations and you reading off a paper and the wind just take it away. <laughs> oh, I can't give up oblations now. You gotta have it up here, all right? So you that are still giving your oblations off the basics, we got some priests that are newly getting ready to get consecrated. All praise to the Most High. Let's give them a hand of, round of hand of applause. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, as I always say, you got to be like a horse. You got to be born standing up, ready to run. Because they got wolves and foxes and jackals ready to eat you up. You don't have time, like a, a, like, like a human baby, to sit back and learn after three, four years how to walk. You got to be born ready with these oblations. So be ready. Memorize them, get them down, rehearse them daily so that you can be fervent when we actually go do it. The may, Most High may start to shake the earth violently at that time. And you're going to be required to continue on. When they was at war with Moses and Joshua, and they was fighting in the land. Moses was giving up oblations. And they was winning, hmm. holding up his hand, absolutely. And when he got tired and hands went down, he stopped on the oblations. The enemy started winning. Moses was like, I need some help. I've been holding my hands up for four hours. Mm -hmm. And so men got on one arm and men got on the other arm holding it up for Moses. Hallelujah. If he had a, he didn't know his oaths, didn't know his oblations, it would have been a wrap for us. We have to be prepared. This is why we have a strong, are building a strong, robust priesthood, portership, and holy singers. So at times like these, we can go and do what was prophesied for us to do in these latter days. We may not understand the most high always, but it's always for a purpose. And that purpose may make sense tomorrow. Just do the will of the most high today. Right. Don't doubt. Be fervent. Stoic. And have that stick to itness to do the will of our Abba. And that's what we're doing, and this is what we're planning on doing tomorrow. All right. Excellent line of questioning, sis. Now you understand what I was talking about with the book, right? <laughs> Absolutely, all praises. Uh, anybody else? All right, right over here. Shalom. Um, Shalom. That was a very powerful Shalom. class. Thank you. Um, all praise to Ava. Yeah, I have about four questions. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, the the second book of Adam and Eve. I can't believe I missed that one. Or I think it was the first book where we went over like how they did the city. I can't believe I missed that. There was the city of Adam. I, I can't believe I missed that, but um, I had a question. So the Garden of Eden, so is it between, on the map here, um, the west side and east side of Africa, like in between, that's the Garden of Eden specifically? You see where it says the city of Adam? Yeah. That's the Garden of Eden. Oh, okay, gotcha. Right. My bad. That's Mount Zion. That is the navel of the earth. That's what they call the eye of Africa. They also call it the Rekot structure. Okay. In the Saharan Desert, that is the city of Adam. Oh, okay, the Garden of Eden, city of Adam. And then on the east side that was where Moses was at absolutely okay, you go gotcha. all the way over in the straight line you'll find Mount Sinai in what is currently Arabia south of Israel or southeast of Israel that's where Moses went up got the commandments came back down on the east side of Shem's land or I like to call it the backyard way in the backyard all right but the most High charged him to be front and center Right there in the front yard, this is the holiest place. The holy of holies, where the most high dwell, is in Western Africa. This is amazing. The same land that they said a bunch of apes and gorillas and people that were shiftless came from. You know? And it's hard for the Khazars to pretend, I'm from Western Africa. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You see, my skin is very good. <laughs> you wouldn't last there, okay? Especially in antiquity. All right? So you can't claim it. That's the thing. And so if you can't claim that that is the place of your origin, what do you do? Hide it. Yeah. 
hide it. You may be able to stretch that you from Israel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't believe that either, you know. But you may be because Europe is right there. You know, they put a little whammy. But look, you're going down to, I mean, you're going to Africa. Come on. Hmm. All right. Everybody there's complexion is burnt. All right. Dark. <laughs> yeah, beautifully burnt as well. And so was Adam's. This was his complexion as well. Not that this is a racial thing or anything. The Mosai is showing you that that was the original man. That's just what it was. All right? And the people that came and usurped who we are could never claim to be that. Never. There's not a Balfour agreement or any kind of British or English that can go down and say, oh, yeah, you, I guess I'll give you Mauritania. I guess you're from there. They'd be look, they looked at him crazy when they asked for Palestine. I'm like, well, what are you doing? You're just as pale as us. What are you doing? That's not, uh, you want it? Go ahead. And they found no rest over there. And they would never find rest mm -hmm. from the Most High if they would have gotten this land. The Most High himself, I think personally, they knew it and they was afraid. Terrified. Absolutely. We may get that part, but we get over there, the Most High himself may open the door and stomp us in his front yard. <laughs> and they said, we'll settle for the eastern side. All right? So, yes, that's... Um, that's where it is. It's on the western side of Africa, uh, what is called now Africa, but that's Shem's land. That is Shem's territory. And a lot of Israelites focus only on Israel, and we look yeah. at Africa and be like, that's not us. Yeah. That's, that's heathen land right there. You don't know scripture. The Most High went east to west, okay? East to west, and everything sub Sahara was given to essentially Ham, everything north of Sahara. Uh, but the Swiss Alps was given unto Japheth, and everything in between was Shem. And we're going to reclaim it, repossess it. Believe that. Exactly. All right. You say you had another question? Yeah, uh, three more. Uh, the second one, I, I got to ask, I'm from Zimbabwe, so like, is there any significance um, for Zimbabwe being um, kind of close to South Africa? And mm -hmm. That means to... you special, huh? <laughs> 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 That's what it means. you very special. Absolutely. I say that uh, the Most High is calling you. That's just what it is. For you to be few amongst your people to be waking up is telling. It's very telling. And so you, of all people, are going back home, you know, going back to the place of our nativity. All of us, I should say, going right. back. Some of us were in exile, you know. We are in exile at this very moment, and we seek to go back home, all right? Some of us have gotten comfortable here. The Most High said, rise. This is not your rest. rest. There is your rest. We've gotten comfortable. You know, we've gotten jobs. We've gotten, you know, money, little land, all of that. And we think we're good here. That actually destroyed us. Yeah. Brothers are now seeking reparations. Reparations. <laughs> you know, somebody murdered your child. And you turn around and say, well, you give me a million dollars. I'm good. Well, I'm good. We can overlook. No, this is a criminal charge. It's not a civil charge. All right, slavery, butchering, massacring was a criminal charge. And nobody in criminal courts, I sat a lot of court for, you know, a couple of dollars. <laughs> no, you need to be found guilty and the punishment must be placed upon you. Then we sue you civilly afterward. But once again, we playing checkers when they playing chess. You mean no criminal charge. I give you a couple of trillion dollars, you good. Yes, when they cut us a check for what they owe us, the economy will tank. Oh, yeah. And your $400 trillion will be $4. <laughs> Nothing. Nothing. And they'll be like, you signed a contract. You know, it's over. Most high, you can't judge us. You know, we made good on our evils. I don't want your money. Keep your money. I got orichalcium in my homeland. I got energy. I got power. I got glory over there. And that's where I'm going. If you're going to repair that is broken, then help me go back. That's how you give reparation to me. Help me go back. Go to Mauritanium and tell them this is this belong to them. All right, you got 24 hours to get up out of here. Go to Morocco. Go to all these places. Tell them, y'all got to get up out of here. That's the least we can do. But they won't do it. And so it's going to be taken by the power of the Most High. All right? Um, thanks. I had to ask for the Shana people watching online. Um, the third question I had was um, the Mark of Cain. So that covenant where um, there's no forgiveness for him. Was that just because he didn't repent for murdering Abel? Because it says in the first book of Adam and Eve, um, the last chapter, verse 21, for if Cain had repented at the time, and he had said, O oh, Abba, forgive me my sin in the murder of my brother, Abba would then have forgiven him his sin. 
if he had repented, would the mark of Cain exist and would he have repentance? No. Or? That repentance, which means convert, convert from what? Satan had entered into him in the seventh verse. He said, if you do well, you shall be accepted. If you do not well, sin lieth at the door and unto thee shall be his desire. He shall enter into you and control you. So it's saying if you would have at that moment got sin out when the Most High came, he would have forgave you. But you held on to sin like some of us do today. We do wickedness and we I ain't do nothing. We murders, we killers, we what I ain't do nothing. I don't need to change. And so we're holding on to sin. And so the most high will not forgive you if you do not confess your sin. If you not say it was it wasn't me, it was sin that dwells in me, please remove it from me and burn it. If he would have did it, the most high would have forgiven him. But he did it. And the most high gave him a mark and said, You will forever, never be forgiven. The same covenant that was given to Hasatan. No forgiveness on you. Forever. It's over. And so at the end of the day, at the end of everything, if he don't extinguish every one of us, this is his plan, he will never be forgiven and he will be exterminated. But the prophecy says that he will be thrown in the lake of fire. Yeah. Not that he shall kill all of us and he shall win, but his false prophet or the false church going to be with him. And all of his governments, the beast and all of that are going to be extinguished. What is the lake of fire? It is the altar. Absolutely. The brazen altar. Huge, humongous in earth. It may look like a big old sea of fire, but it's a brazen altar that burns evil spirits. Mm. And so anybody who do not release sin will be in the covenant of Cain or Hasatan, and they will die with him. If I can add on to that point as well. Kind of, um, kind of looking at uh, how Satan operates, how he tries to copy what the Most High does. Just like the Heavenly Father has his chosen, Satan had his chosen. Mm. So just like Satan... Or just like the Most High chose Abel, and then obviously Abel died, and then he chose Seth. Now Seth, he chose this lineage. There were other people with them. Seth and Abel, uh, Adam had other children, but Seth had the chosen lineage. So then to Enos and Canaan and so on. All the way down uh, to Noah, then Shem, then Arphaxad and so on, all the way up to Abraham, then Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, then Israel, and then so on. So it was the same thing with Satan. So Satan had his chosen. And the Most High had his chosen who was going to be in the covenant with the Heavenly Father. Satan had his chosen who was going to be in the covenant with him. So Satan's covenant had no redemption. He chose Cain to be in this covenant in which there is no redemption as well. And we see that also playing about in uh, the situation with uh, Azazel. How the children of Seth were on top of the mountain. And what did Seth say to them? Or Jared say to them as well. Mm -hmm. You are the children of Abba. But if you go down this mountain, you shall be the children of the devil. And they went down. And then what happened after they went down, they did with their business. They're like, I want to go back up. Good. And what happened? They couldn't go back up. There was no redemption for them. So much so when the Most High flooded everything, he said, unto Azazel, ascribe all sin. Send all that stuff back to him because he's going to get burnt up with it because he brought it back into the earth. Mm -hmm. So it's the same similar thing with Cain. Even though he was like, what did I just do? Satan had already chosen him. He was already locked in. And there was no escape in it. Khan. Huh. All right. Khan, last question, promise. Okay. Uh, so we were, we were talking about this on the way over here. Um, we were wondering, since he talked about like the water and how the flood happened with the explanation of the water, we were wondering, because like, we always see like spaceships going up in the sky and then like, there's like a tilt. We were wondering if we're, like, we're being lied to, if like the world's like circular or if it's flat and like the world's just trying to t make us think that it's circular and... If you're not allowed to tell us that, I understand. Cause come, come. <laughs> you know, it really doesn't matter if the earth is octagonal, all right? We are going to rule it, right? And it doesn't change anything about what we talked about. That is a battle that's not for us. You know, conspiracy theories and all of that, they, you know, some people be like, answer that. And if I give an answer to that, they're going to cut the TV. I don't want to hear nothing else. All this debt that got dropped because I said the earth was flat, they're going to leave. If I say it's round, they're going to leave. All right, so it doesn't matter. That's not our argument. It has nothing to do with us. If it's round, that doesn't change anything. If it's flat, that doesn't change anything. We're still going to give the oblations in the city of Adam, and the Most High going to give us dominance over it. And then we'll see, for a fact, what it is. But regardless, one argument may seem silly as all get out, but somebody's taking that serious. And another may seem like, you know, scientists are trying to, you know, get us. But once again, it doesn't matter the shape of it. That's not going to change when you give the O's or the oblations or when you worship the Heavenly Father. None of it. For us, that's not our battle unless somebody else fight that. We fight that battle to go back to the navel of the earth 
but the Most High is going to feed us and begin to repopulate and redistribute the spiritual wealth to those who are acquiescing to the will of the Most High right here. All right, so definitely that's the answer for it. I know we're going to get a thousand emails, but it is flat. I'm going to give you the proof, but it's round. Here it is. All right, doesn't really matter. All right. All right, quite welcome. Anyone else? All praises. All praises. Hello to Waiyata Abba. Abba for that class. Mm -hmm. So my question is um, out of Isaiah 14, um, verse 12 specifically, when it's talking about Lucifer falling from heaven. Uh, is the city of Adam where he fell and Absolutely. landed? Isaiah 14 is not talking about Satan the devil. Mm -hmm. Lucifer is a transliteration. Mm -hmm. If they would, meaning they didn't translate it. Right. All right. It's left in his Hebrew. Like when you see hallelujah or hallelujah, you'll see hallelujah. That's a, a, a transliteration. They left it there to really connote the impact or what Israel was saying. You know, the most I said something, hallelujah. And so they left it like that. You could have said praise Yah. And it wouldn't have the same, you know, logistics to it to convey to your heart that they was crying out. Lucifer, they did it for Catholicism. They wanted to scare you. They wanted a boogeyman. Translate it for what it is, light bearer. That's what it is. And so when it's called light bearer, Satan never bear, bear any light. Hmm. He was always the prince of darkness. The Messiah was called uh, the bright morning star. He was called he who brought light. And Adam himself was he who brought the light of the first day. And began to put it into all creatures that was on the earth. So Isaiah 14 is talking about Adam falling. And then all the creatures of the earth was like, how have you become one of us? Yeah. You low like us. You used to come and give the morning oblations. You was like an angel. But now you're pathetic. You're lower than us. Beastly. Like Beastly. Us. Absolutely. Eating at Alpo. <laughs> <laughs> so... The Most High put it in there that that's Adam. Once again, a malignant, evil translation to boister their theology was put forth and we fell for it. And you have Hebrews to this day, that Luciferian doctrine. <laughs> that Luciferian, they, they of the death. That don't mean that. Satan himself wished he was Lucifer. Yeah. Wished he was an angel of light. For Satan himself is transformed into an yeah. angel of light. Said he's the light bearer. And so they pushed that as if that was Hasatan, when Hasatan is Bohemoth and Leviathan. And all the Confederate names that we just skipped over, that's who he is. He's not that we bring the light. We bring the light, the information of the will of the Most High upon the earth. Good observation, sis, right on point. And we could go through that whole chapter and break it out. It is amazing. So I recommend everybody go to Isaiah 14, read it with that comprehension and understanding. It's absolutely amazing. Con. And so um, off of um, Brother TJ's question, the inference that, you know, um, not just the inference, but what you were saying as far as that Satan had made a covenant with um, Cain at that time. Can we make an inference that he, that Lucifer, or excuse me, Lucifer, that Satan also has covenants as Abba has covenants with individuals Con. throughout these millennium Con. to fulfill his work? Okay. Con. And that covenant, you're talking about like these micro covenants and agreements, you know, you will find... Men like Gideon, or no, not Gideon. Who was he? Um, Ginnon. Ginnon. My bad. Ginnon. Been a long day, brothers and sisters. All right, we at the end. Ginnon. Satan had a special covenant with him. He was a musical savant. He was evil. He was wicked. When he played, Satan entered into him and entered into everybody he was around. Special covenant with them. You see it with the uh, musicians today. Oh yeah. You see them. They playing that music. You start moving. So you know you can juke somebody, stab them. You don't even know why. <laughs> they got in you. But reality, though, your mind is changed. You end up doing things that you ought not, saying things that you should not. That thing still persists to this day. But on a macro level, he keeps bringing you into that earthly covenant, that earthly covenant of Akia. We was designed for Bequa, that a covenant that was above. And any time he shows you that the earthly covenant is superior, he polish it up and be like, wow, you know, they gave sacrifice in the temple. It was golden. It was beautiful. They had Levites. You want to do that too? You could be a priest. And we like, I love it. Hmm. I, can, I can be a Levitical priest. 
And you got brothers running around talking about their Levitical priests. Yeah. And Satan is just loving it like, yeah, stay in, stay in that earthly covenant. But we want to leave it entering into the spiritual. Good point, sis. Absolutely. Anything else? Okay. All right, anybody else? In here? Okay, got someone over here. Um, so from my understanding, at the end of the sixth day, when the saints are in that first resurrection and we're put into that rest for a thousand years and the saints will return home to the city of Adam for that rest and they will be the rulers over the earth. After that thousand years at the eighth day, will we then all return back home to heaven or will the earth then become like new Jerusalem and the only ones that remain are those who have been saved after that first and second resurrection? It's going to be as it was in the beginning, as if there was a, the scripture call it the regeneration. When you read in Genesis 2, it's speaking speak about these are the generations of the earth. So the Most High is currently, and we covered this in the class, and we're going to be bringing it out again. He's currently right now regenerating the earth. And we talk about in the first millennium, just like in the first age, the Most High created the light. He had the sons of light. He had the children of Adam on top of that mountain, bright, the white horse of revelation. And so he perfected that first age. Now, in the second millennium, just like the second day, that was a red horse. And wickedness was all over the place. And what happened? You remember in creation what happened in the second day? The, the waters were created the first day for the baptism, and the land created the second day for the seed. All right. All right. So now, anybody want to help her? Anything? So what happened in the second day? Absolutely. The waters of the firmament. Absolutely. So... So you're right on point. The waters of the firmament were created for baptism. What happened in the second millennium? Anybody? Anybody know? Flood of Noah. Absolutely. So the Most High said, I created the second day again, washed off everything. Y'all didn't break the regeneration. All right. In the third millennium, we come up again. The Most High made the vegetation. He made all of that. And so in the third millennium comes Moses. And he comes with the meat offering, the grain offering. This is the black horse in Revelation when he says a penny for barley and a penny for wheat hurt not the oil nor the wine. I'm paraphrasing. He's talking about you can't touch the oblations in the third millennium because this is the vegetation coming up again. This is the re we are already engaged in the regeneration. What happened on the fourth day or the fourth age? Anybody know in Genesis? Sun, moon, and stars. Anybody know what happened in the fourth millennium? David set up the temple. Solomon built the temple, but he put David's covenant in the midst. This is when he had the 24 lots, the new months, the course of David. He began to say, at this time, according to the sun, moon, and stars, in the regeneration, he put this there. Now, in the fifth day of creation, or the fifth age, what happened? Anybody? We just read about it. Bohemoth and Leviathan, they started tripping. All right, they broke up everything. They broke the generation up. Anybody know what happened in the fifth millennium? Yahawashai. Yahawashai came and said, this was the day that Bohemoth and Leviathan screwed up. Yes. So I myself will come down there and make sure that the regeneration is not broken. And he came down, walked on water like Leviathan, mm -hmm. cursed the fig tree like Bohemoth. He began to command the heavens and the earth, perfecting governance of the regeneration. Now on the sixth day of creation, what happened? Remember sixth day? Man, Adam, absolutely, Adam was made. In the sixth millennium, created him in his image, absolutely. In the sixth millennium, what is happening? Or what happened? Absolutely, we're there. We're in the sixth millennium. So it is our job to fulfill the regeneration of let man be made in his image. This is our generation. And everything in the past was fulfilled. Don't think the Most High going to get up to the six and start choking. <laughs> he's going to fulfill it. He's going to make man in his image. And like you said, says, he's going to now say, now enter into the seventh day. Now the Most High is going to come in the cool of the morning. That's going to be on the seventh day. And he's going to look around and say, uh, Adam, where's, it's right here, Abba. You ain't got to talk no more. It's right here. We've been waiting on you all day. It's right here to meet, to drink, right? And it's going to be good. And it's not going to be broken. This is the regeneration that Christ spoke about. Yahweh spoken of. 
This is happening right now. We're at the tail end. So matter, uh, imagine a vase being built. The first one had a blemish. It cracked. And Moses said, I got to rebuild it. And so his Elohim started building it from ground up. And where it cracked before, because that was a pressure point, the word who is over all Elohim said, I myself, I'm going down there to make sure this vase don't crack. Yeah. And Satan was like, come on, man, I'll take you to the high mountain. You want to rule? You want to you wanna crack this vase? You want to, you want to, uh, I ain't got time for that. Not at all. And he perfected it. And when that millennium was over, it was codified in history. It's done. Now, it is our time. Hmm. Now, it is our time. If we fail, the vase, the vase is cracked. And we got to do it all over again. Start again from the regeneration from day one. 7,000 more years. And Satan will love it. I get 7,000 more years to try them and tempt them. So let us make sure that we are made again in his image. As you said, sis, beautiful lineup, beautiful questioning, is that we are to be made in the image of the Most High because we're in the sixth millennium, just like the sixth age or the sixth day, and we will be made angelic, enter back into Bequa or the heavenly covenant, and no more carnal, and we shall be like angels of the Most High on the Shabbat of rest. This is what John the Revelator was talking about. They shall reign as kings and priests for a thousand years, the seventh year, over the whole earth in the city of Adam. Righteousness. All right? So that's the answer to it. Right on point. Excellent. Hallelujah. Any more questioning? Questions? All right, we got one in the back. Shalom, please. Shalom, Mark. Um, so I stepped out for a minute. A moment. Well, so that, I just that, make that, sure, that disqualifies uh, you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we asked the question we didn't already answer. Though. <laughs> yeah, that's why I want to make sure. Nah, go ahead. Um, going back to talking about the city of of Adam, um, in the book of Jasher, did you use that scripture, or did you touch on uh, the second book of Jasher, verse six, where it talks about Gihon? Con. And it destroyed the third of the, so that is con con. Said, Absolutely, okay. we went through it. Absolutely. Okay, I just want to make sure. I'll go back. I'll go back. Con, and watch you, it. Uh, we showed how in the uh, second chapter, when it's uh, at the times of Adam, how they call it a river. Then we fast forward in the 10th chapter to the times of Abram was alive. Before his covenant, they call it an ocean. So showing how it had spread wide from a river all the way up to what we now consider the Atlantic Ocean at that time, after the flood of Noah. Was it Oceana? Absolutely. Oceanus, yeah, kind of. Oceana. All right. Shalom. Shalom, shalom. Yes. I have a question. Come. Uh, go ahead, please. Come in. So, as we prepare to go back to the neighbor of the earth, I was looking at it as a, like the placenta. A woman, a woman has a placenta. Come. We're going back to the neighbor to get that direct connection to get all the power, everything that we need from the direct source where nothing can break that power coming directly from where the Most High has his... Uh, I guess you say his foot Con. stapled in the earth, even though he in the heavenly realm. So you're getting that direct power straight down where no interruption, no nothing. That's right. Can, uh, get into it. That's right. When the Most High moved Jerusalem, all right, when he moved Jerusalem, Jerusalem just means the city of peace offering. And the Most High said, wherever I place my name, that is Jerusalem. He moved it from the city of Adam to where we now call Israel for a moment. And Solomon built a temple, a resemblance of what was in heaven. But Revelation speak about new Jerusalem. Come on. It shall be again, not there. If it was there, it would be old Jerusalem. But new city of peace offering, he's taking it back to the origin, the original place. That is new Jerusalem. You won't look at Israel anymore and say Jerusalem, none of that. You're going to be looking at the west of Africa. That is the city of peace offerings to the most high and they will be offered to the most high day and night without cease right on point out and that's going to connect the energy from heaven to those who are on earth all right this is going to bring about a absolute revolutionary change upon this earth that we have not seen since the days of adam as the akkadians and the sumerians said sumerians said they were saying once again they was like we can't even they called adam and his children gods all right. And they began to worship them. But we know they were not the most high. They were angelic. It literally showed depictions. You ever seen some of that in Mesoamerica, some of the, you know, some of the Incan Mayans, some of that little artwork and all that? Yeah. They too were writing about what we was doing during our time. You see men in little spaceships, 
all kind of little chariots moving around, doing all kind of stuff being lifted up from the earth. Even the pyramids were created by the sons of Adam. Scriptures tell you that they built those to try to prepare for the post-flood. And in it, they put the hieroglyph. They wrote what it's going to take. Remember, they was going off. They was wicked. They knew the Most High was going to destroy the earth by water or flood. And they said, let us build something that if water, if fire comes, it's going to bake the hieroglyphs all in it. And then they come after, they can read it. But if the water comes, it's not going to move these big old rocks. All right. And so afterward, they can begin to read it and begin to conjure up these spirits. And that is exactly what happened. The books tell us that the sons of Arphaxad actually went over into Egypt, saw these mega structures, and learned to read them and started conjuring up evil spirits. And Noah went back and said, what in, you read some of that, what in the world is going, these are the same spirits that was here before the flood. How did they come back? Mm. Because they left those little rituals and all of those things to bring forth trespasses. And he gave up a blazing sin offering, but left a tenth of them. And just like mildew, just like mold, you leave a small bit, it comes back. Yeah, it's gonna grow. And they began to come back. And so all of these uh, great megaliths that you read about was here pre-flood. A lot of it had to do with righteousness. Some of it had to do with wickedness. But all of it had to do with us. All right. Good point. Uh, we got a question over here. Okay, so I don't know if you can answer like this question like exactly, but based on where we are like right now, how much time do you think we have until we begin the start of returning to the city of Adam? Khan, Shalom, by the way. Um, Yahweh Shai said you can judge a tree all the times by the leaves, by the fruit it bears, right? And so judging according to prophecy, what's happening right now, the Most High is right on the cusp. Now, I'm not going to give a day. I ain't going to say six months. You know, it's all over. Six months. Hmm. Deplete your bank account and put it in mine. Right? <laughs> Sound like some Creflo stuff right there. Keep your bank account. Keep working. Keep doing what you do. As the Most High give it, we've gotten here by following the Heavenly Father. We're going to continue to go by following the Heavenly Father. Just be ready. The Most High, once again, like I said, we're going to be sending out, you know, Joshua, Caleb. We're going to be sending out men to go and spy it out and give these oblations and come back with a message. And if the Most High give us a message, what we are to do, we're going to convey it to the congregation. This is what we got to do. But we're not going to be presumptuous and say, by this time, it's going to be it, it's going to be over. The Most High may tell us to do this, do this, and do this. But it is the place of our home, and we are all preparing to return. So I'm not going to put a timeline on it, sis. That's it. Let's get the mic over to the sis for our next when that time comes, like what, within House of Wisdom, what would our protocol be? Like how are we going to get that word out to the congregation? It may not be get the word out. If a house is on fire, you ain't gonna go, right. and that, yeah, hey, let me teach you. I'm getting out of here. <laughs> Follow me. <laughs> if not, like, you're a crispy we critter. Like, well, it, it, the most high is calling. It's not us, he's calling. And it's a lot of people hearing this message right now that the Most High got. They're hearing it. They're locked in. They say, I want to be a part of that. The scripture said this world was made for many. The world to come is made for few. Mm -hmm. So don't think that there's going to be billions of us coming. It's going to be a small confederacy. When this go out, trust me, the heathen Satan is going to come up against it. He came up against it in the past. He's going to come up against it. Absolutely not. Y'all can't come over here. We banning this. Nope, you're not doing it. Anybody coming over here with a Bible, whatever. It's, it's going to be all kind of stuff he's going to do to try to stop the Most High. Remember, he's not fighting against us. You're fighting against the prophecies of the Most High. So put up whatever you want to put. Mm -hmm. And watch an earthquake take California and put it in the ocean. And we're going to be like Moses. Let my people go. Uh, I'll let you go. But no, I'm not. Once again, New York, a hurricane hit it. A volcano just pop up on 48th Street. <laughs> and freaking lava the whole place down. Hey, Pharaoh, let my people go. We're trying to go to the mountain, not to ski, not to camp. We're trying to go on a three days journey to sacrifice, sacrifice unto Abba. And worship the Most High. And this is modern Egypt, or spiritual Egypt. So trust that they're going to put impediments up. But don't be discouraged. Don't be discouraged at all. Just keep persisting. It's not us. Moses didn't come out with guns. He didn't come out with arrows, spears, chariots, none of that. He just 
held his staff up and said, okay, sorry to hear that, Pharaoh. But your first want to be dead by the night. Mm. Bounced. Kind. And eventually they let him go. And then they reluctantly turned back around and said, we got to get, we got to get, get, we can't let him do that. Because they knew when the children of Israel reached their point of power, it was over for them. Yeah, done. So trust me, it's not only going to be them, it's going to be the whole colonialized Western society are against the saints. The powers that be do not want to see themselves dethroned. And what I'm talking about right now to them is treason. I'm, I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if the sheriff's downstairs. I, uh, Secret Service said, come get you. All right, you're talking about treason on this country. All right, that's not what we're talking about. We're not lifting the hand. We're not doing anything. I am lifting hands to heave to the most high, but we're not carrying, bearing weapons or any of that to overthrow any government. We're just like the saints of old. If you don't believe in our God, then this will come to naught. If you think that we're talking foolishness, this is, this is nothing. Just another religious cult, as they were said, that mean nothing. So why make laws against us? Yeah. Keep doing what you do. They're going to do it because they already feel the power of the Most High burning them right now. So the answer to it, says is in due time, the Most High. You know, in Wisdom of Solomon 18, Pharaoh didn't let him go. And it says that Moses, Aaron, and Miriam sacrificed secretly. Secretly. So a lot of the stuff we're going to say, we ain't going to say. We're not going to say. But if you're in the congregation, you coveted it, you're going to know what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Because they're trying to watch every move. And there's only one secret place. Only one secret place. You can be on your phone chatting and talking. They know all that. You can start sending yourself some braille messages or, you know, speaking in Morris code or some sending yourself a whatever, smoke signal. They know it all. They in your house listening every day. Anybody who think that they got some secrecy is a fool. And it's, they are addicted to data. It's only one secret place, and that's in your chamber of imagery. And the Most High is making that chamber of imagery so broad that brothers and sisters are going to meet at that place and begin to talk as we talk in here, knowing that there's nobody eavesdropping. Yeah. There's nobody going to take this. If, and no wicked person can go there. So ain't no Judases there. Ain't nobody there going to go start telling the man what our next move is. Hmm. Because no wicked thing will be able to enter that place. So again, exercise your spirit. Rehearse the oblations, priests and porters and holy singers. And those who are in the congregation constantly get the oblation. Stay in those lots. This is where we get that power. If I could add on to that point too, uh, to uh, hopefully uh, aid the sister in like, some of the concerns that she may have. Um, as Chief Priest was mentioning, the scriptures talk about just like that exodus that they had out of physical Egypt, the same or a similar thing would happen with the saints of today. And I don't think there were any Israelites not knowing that there was an exodus happening. When the whole world got dark and the Egyptians couldn't see, and when they heard the whole scream of the Egyptians when the firstborn was getting killed and when they saw all the plagues, they knew, all right, it's time. Time is coming. So I don't think it's like a, we got to whisper and send messages like, hey, sis, it's time. Make sure, you, make sure you pack your bags. I think the Most High is going to show and reveal in the earth that it's time. As Chief Priest was mentioning, there may be, we go to Joe Biden and say, let my people go. And he may say no. And as Chief Free said, an earthquake comes and splits D.C. in two. And then we come back and say, let my people go. And so on and so forth until the Heavenly Father redeems us out. So I don't think there's going to be any confusion as to when that time is. And as a nation, we're not going back to the city of Adam on Delta Airlines. Our Emirates. Uh, certainly not. What's that, what's that cheap one called? Spirit. spirit. <laughs> we are not flying Spirit Airlines back to the city of Adam. Engines falling off. We, I mean, really. I mean, it's not happening. I, you know, I say that jokingly, but the Most High promised that as we left Egypt, he's going to bring us out of Egypt. He literally talks about parting the ocean again. He literally talks about parting a river or waters again. So when the so-called Pangea happened again, Gihon, those that are over here in mass, is going to get parted again, and it's going to be a simple walk. And those who are scattered all over, all those rivers that we talked about, it's going to start parting, and the saints are coming back home. And everybody, every nation that's holding the saints, they will be rewarded for rendering them up. It says even after the great exodus, they may find a Hebrew in there and say, we got a Hebrew left. And go back, we found one. What is our reward? You shall get a double dose of orichalcium. 
<laughs> so the Most High is bringing the Saints home. All right. Can Any I other? Something? I want to read something. Con, con, go ahead. Uh, uh, Jeremiah 16 and 14. Therefore, behold, the days come, and saith the Heavenly Father, that it shall be no more said that the Heavenly Father liveth that brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. But the Heavenly Father liveth that brought up the children of Israel from the land of the north and from all the lands whither they had been driven, uh, had driven them. And I will bring them again into their land, and I will give unto their, give unto their fathers. Uh, but that's it on that. Khan, the most I say, you're not going to speak about old Egypt. Nobody's going to be talking about Pharaoh and those chariots and all of that. They're going to be talking about the, the most high who brought the children of Israel out of spiritual Egypt and out of the north, east, west, and south, all the lands that they were scattered into. That's what the most high is going to be known for. This is going to be a major, major story written for the children to come in the future. Major event. Absolutely, a major event. And so we are living in it right now. So some of us say, boy, if I was back during the time of Exodus, <laughs> man, I wouldn't have been chiding. Well, here's your chance right now. Here's your chance. You're going to be Dathan and all of those talking about, yeah, you know, we, I remember eating at the Golden Corral. <laughs> I, man, I remember eating at Fogo de Chao. It was delicious, man. Now they feeding us this stuff from heaven? Hmm. Man, more over here sucks. You know, all this angel break. Can I just go back to New York City and get a cheese pizza? <laughs> this is what they was doing in Egypt or in Sinai. They wanted to go back to Egypt yeah. and eat the food they was eating in Egypt. So much so that they even asked, uh, can your God make a clean table with some um, all kind of silverware and all of that on here? Can he do that? Most I looked at him and said, you simple morons. I'm giving you the food and you want napkins? You want me to wipe your mouth too? That's what you want? How about this? You cursed. And so the Most High is saying, don't prefer. Don't get acquainted with what's going on here in Western society. You may not have an iPhone over there, all right? You may not have an Android. You may not have any of that, all right? But you have something way better. you in contact with the angels. Yeah. You and you, you, you're literally looking over at the cosmos. And new technology is there. Well, anybody talking about, Dad, we ain't even got a website. We ain't got an email address. You're telepathically talking to somebody yeah, come on. and you talking about emailing somebody or texting somebody those people are not going to make it yeah. All right. this new technology the nations wish they had the most I took it from them if they had it they will run this earth with an iron fist they will have that one world government that they all look for and they will have everybody at their whim beck and call it's not for them, it's for righteous people. Yeah. Not that we're going to rule the earth, one government in wickedness, we're going to run it in righteousness like Adam was in the beginning. And if people don't want to be righteousness, they're going to be cut off from all the greatness and the blessings of the Heavenly Father. And like a branch cut off from the trunk, they're going to wither away. All right, when they go back to horse and buggy and building a house with wood, and, all, and they had palatial estates made out of energy and new technology, that government will be dethroned and a coup d'etat would be performed and the new government would be like oh we want to give our tights again to the most high please turn back on the power and they'll be turned back on and blessings will come upon them this is what the most high is preparing to bring upon this earth it may sound fanatical funny to some but it's all biblical and it's all written and it's all true all right anyone else with any questions i have a question okay shalom. Right. Shalom. 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 Great class. Shallow on. All no, praises I'm to Abba. I'm watch it three times. <laughs> to Check get the series all. out, too, if you really want to digest it. Oh, Absolutely. yeah. Oh, I'm, I can't wait. I'm, uh, I'm waiting with bated breath. I uh, love it. All Everything praises. that's been coming down mm -hmm. is just it's straight from the throne. Mm -hmm. It's got to be. Because it's nothing that we've ever heard before, nothing that we've ever experienced Con. before. And it just it takes a lot for me to, for me personally, to, to just get it down mm -hmm. and so I can operate in it. But I just wanted to make the point that even from the very beginning, the Bible was, I mean, the first line was tainted. You see it? Absolutely. The first line of it was tainted. Mm -hmm. And now, and even when I was reading, um, when um, the Most High said, let us make man in our image, mm -hmm. they, they presented it or posited like he was talking to uh, um, Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. But when he really was talking to the angels of mm -hmm. sanctification and the angels of presence. Mm -hmm. That's who he was talking to. And I learned that in the book of Yasher. Okay. That's who he was actually talking to. Mm -hmm. So I'm just, I just wanted to make the point that when I read the word now, 
I can tell where it's been tampered with. I can see it. Con. You Con. know, the wisdom will show it to me that this is where it's been tampered with. And then right. I'll go do a little research and I'll see where it was really meant to be. Con. So I just wanted to make that point, even from the first line. So when, when we read the word, we have to be very cognizant of that. And we can only read it through wisdom. That's, there you go. Yeah. There you go. Con. Right on point, right on point. And we're going to be going through the whole chapter and breaking down that 26 verse as well. Some more depth is going to come out of that. But they have these rules of translation called a syntax. And if you don't abide by that, if you abide by it, you're going to get the same old translation they got. Right. That syntax is said, take that eth out. It's not translatable. And if you do, then you're not abiding by the syntax. You're not doing that. Oh. Or if you translate uh, reshith as first, you're not abiding by the syntax. It has to be beginning. You may create an NIV. But you got to say in the beginning. Right. And all of them say in the beginning. They may change a little bit here, but it's all in the beginning. Elohim is always God. Right. You're abiding by the sentence structure that they put forth. And if you go outside of that, that's not valid. We don't endorse that. Yeah. That's crazy talk. I already see it coming. That's crazy talk. What's crazy about it? All right, come in. We're going to the Hebrew, breaking it down word for word. What's crazy? Nothing's crazy about it. They don't want you, like Hasatan, to go back to the kingdom of heaven that first verse of Genesis the most high the most high create the first thing of creation were the Elohim and a covenant in heaven and a covenant in earth is absolutely powerful so much more than in the beginning God made heaven and earth so much more powerful there's a covenant in heaven and there's a covenant in earth we found out it's Bequa and Nakia two covenants which one you gonna which one you want to go to they don't want you to know that so as I said, you have brothers reading the actual modern Hebrew. But it's translated. You might as well be bringing, reading the King James Version. It's not the word-for-word -word literal translation. If so, it will be hard to understand. And so go to the actual word-for-word -word translation and you'll begin, if the Spirit is with you, understand. But a lot of times, brothers wouldn't prefer that because the Spirit is not with them. And they'd be like, this is hard. I'm just seeing these nouns right just block words i don't even know what it's talking but we know because the spirit is showing us so great point sis that even the most pristine bible and i know most hebrews you know they're going over to the sefer and please don't spend money on that sefer or that sefer all right bunch of trash i mean people changing names around they don't say lord is elohim is yahweh what is that going to do nothing hmm. nothing i can do that on my own the tetragrammaton all right, Greek, four words. That's simply what it is. And the YHWH is not the Most High's name either. All right, don't really want to go into it. And on top of that, lastly, before we go to the next, a lot of people that? fight over the name of the Most High. They see the Tetragrammaton, right? There are no vowels in it. And so any one of us can experiment with that. Put a vowel wherever you want, and you can say that that's the name. There's nothing in antiquity that has the vowels in it that say his name is YA. H A W A Yahweh. Somebody else turned around and said, No, his name is Yehoah. I put an E after that. Put that vowel. Somebody can put an O. Somebody can say Yahweh. It's just a pl placement of vowels. And, you know, that's not what we are charged to do. We know that the Most High has given us his express name in these latter days because he's our Abba. All right? And his express name to us is Father, Abba. And we are children from the placenta, the navel of the earth, being fed by our creator. All right, his name is not Ahiah. He's not I am that I am. That's not what he was talking about. This is a Hebrew phrase. If his name is I am that I am, many prophets are called I am that I am. Paul said it himself. He said, I stood there at the stoning of Stephen. I was against the church. I can't change my past. I am what I am. That's a phrase that means check my history. My past, I can't change it. And so when the Most High told Moses, go tell the people of Israel, I am that I am, he said, who did Jacob say saved him? The Most High, I am he. Who did Isaac say saved him? The Most High, I am he. Who did Abraham say saved him? I am what I am. Just check my history. I'm the one been saving y'all since you guys came out of the city of Adam. That's who I am. Not Ahia. All right, once again, the Most High is going to give unto us. It's no need for us to know his actual noun name. You know, there's no reason for us to know his personal name. If he's your father, you call him father. All right, we say this all the time. If you got a father, anybody who's a respectable father, 
he's your father. And you turn around and say, Jerry Adams Jr., <laughs> the third. Can I borrow the car? He would be in his right to slap the taste out your mouth. Disrespecting him by calling him by his personal name. Call him dad, Abba, father, pops, whatever you want. But that's what children call their father. Call him Abba. Your mother you call Ama, respectfully. And anybody, you know, I said that jokingly, but anybody got their children calling them by their personal name, you done failed somewhere. <laughs> you done failed somewhere. You are a provider. They call you father. They call you mother. And that's what we call our father. And so even if you knew his name, it would be an insult for you to go up and start talking about his name. Lastly on that, the tetragrammaton would place there. It's an acronym. It's an acronym for something we don't know because people have come in thinking that Exodus 20, take not the name of the Most High in vain, thinking that that means don't ever say the Most High without purpose. That's what they think. Like if you say, you know, whatever, you know what I'm saying. <clears throat> I want to, you know, tank this show, but if you say, you know, oh God, mm -hmm. you're saying the name of the Most High in vain, you're going to hell. It's what they tell you. That's not what it's talking about. In, in Deuteronomy 27, the Most High said, today you're my people. In other verses, he says, I shall put my name upon you when you enter into the covenant. You shall become my people and I will become your power. Taking the name of the Most High in vain is you entering into this covenant and then you go out and start wilding. You go out and don't respect the Sabbath. You go out and don't do the covenant that you're in. The Most High's name is on you. Mm. And you're now in vain walking around with his name upon you. The Most High said, I will not forgive you. This is not that phonetic saying, an audible saying of his name. Once again, the religious, skittish, superstitious of us said, I'm going to go through the Bible and take all the names out. And I'm going to stamp this acronym on it that means something. And people do that to this day. You know, don't say Lord, don't say God. When those clearly are not his name. So not to um, elongate, protract this class, you know, the Most High is bringing a plethora of understanding out. We're not to be those superstitious ones. We go direct to the Most High. What's the next question? We got one? Shalom, shalom. Shalom. With the, um, the new placement of the city of David where it is, and right now we're using, you know, the time zone for Jerusalem, will that have any second and third effects, you know, concerning the course of David? Right on point. Brothers, very, very aware. <laughs> the lots are contingent upon the city where the Most High placed his name. And so if the city was Israel, then you do it in Israel. But if he changed it to the city of Adam, then you change it. I'm not going to go into the specifics of it, but we're going to be talking to everybody in the congregation about uh, what the Most High has given us on that. So... Staying close, we're going to actually put it in the group chat and all of that, and uh, we'll be uh, revealing that quite soon. So, good observation, my brother. Absolutely. If the Most High turned around and put it in Chicago, put his name there, that is the first lot. That that Chicago, what is that, Standard Time? Uh, Central. Central Time, absolutely. Yeah. Central Standard, yeah. And Central Standard Time would be the first lot. All right, and so, wherever the Most High placed his name, that is the first lot right there. All right, so a lot of changes is coming into the earth for godliness and righteousness sake. So let us keep asking the Heavenly Father. Excellent question. Uh, anyone else in here with a question? I've got a question in the back. Who says stop asking questions so we can eat? Who, who's that? <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat says. Shalom. Excellent class. Khan, all praise uh, it, Abba. Um, I may have missed it if you said it, but um, are the three circular rings of the city of Adam symbolic of the three major components of the temple, uh, mainly the outer courts, the inner courts, and the Holy of Holies? Khan, absolutely. Right on point. Right assessment. That ancient city was built, well, let me say that the modern temple that was built by Solomon was based on that ancient city, which was based on the kingdom in heaven, all right? And we're going to show you in the, the Bible where that city that we brought up is actually described to the T. All the rings, the water, 
the temple and all of it and the rivers that ran out of it and all the holiness that came out of it this is what Ezekiel saw in the heavens and it was reflected here on earth great observation sis absolutely so the center of it you see that golden temple that was where all the priestly class came and work, worshipped and that outer ring was their living quarters and that third was where the whole congregation came and dwelt and they all worshipped the heavenly father in unison all right any other questions you got something on? yeah we got uh, one last question online uh, sister Maria uh, she asked um, from unity asked um, let me get it real quick she asked um, Shalom chief priest can the other nations come home together with the children of Israel to their nativity to the most high the most high willing all right good question once again um, that place is the epicenter of the earth all nations will be required according to prophecy to come there the gates shall not be closed day nor night for the nations bringing their oblations in that city the only thing is no unrighteousness nor wickedness shall be there that means essentially they're going to have to be in covenant and they're going to have to be righteous and they're going to absolutely come there to bring theirs and to oblate and to praise the heavenly father i would say that they're ambassadors we're talking about what is called the nethanims all right and they're going to have this pre this kingly class i should say that's going to run their country and they're going to come over blessedly bringing all the tights and they're going to be there giving up their oblations right under heaven under the priesthood under the porters and under the holy singers in scripture these were called the nethanims they were there to aid in bringing the wares from the world to the epicenter of the earth absolutely that's a good question we knew that was coming but this is for everybody this is for everybody right, everybody got their part to play long as we're not you know crossing positions you know Con. this has happened all the time yeah. paul set up the church and he said, well, you guys are going to be the Nethanims. And as soon as we went into captivity, they turned around and said, I'm the Jew. I'm not Gentile. I'm Jew. Where are you from? I'm from Judah. Where are you from? Benjamin. I'm Levi. I'm yeah. Levi. I'm Levi. Absolutely. <laughs> so they usurped the authority. They boasted against the branch and claimed to be the branch. Absolutely. And the trunk. Absolutely. And said that we was nothing. So that's the only thing is that everybody, and we said so many times, the children of Israel shall be like Levi. The other nations shall be like the other 11 tribes. We're all one family working together. But Asher can't say to Levi, yo, give me that altar. I'm ready to heave something. Yeah. I'm ready to burn up some oblations to the Most High. He will be burnt. On many occasions, somebody outside of Levi would try to touch the altar and get burnt. You couldn't do, if you wasn't Levi in the Sixth Covenant, what Levi was doing. And there was no jealousy. Everybody knew their position. And so in this greater scheme of things, the Most High is saying everybody got their position and love your position. Some people may be the ear, some may be the eyes, the head, the knees, the feet, but we are all one body coming together. And the ear shouldn't be jealous of the toes. If everybody was a toe, where would hearing come from? If everybody was an eye, how would we walk? It takes everybody. And if everybody was at the navel of the earth, who's going to bring forth the tights? Who's going to yeah. bring forth, you know, all the wares from around the world? We work together in harmony and in synergy, and the world would be ran in righteousness. As we said before, a lot of people like to think that an army is going to be dispatched and a battalion is going to go down there and pretty much be nuclear war in some of these countries. That's how the layman fight. The Most High and his saints fight from heaven. Fine. Simple as that. Y'all don't want to worship the most high? Fine and dandy. Fine and dandy. Y'all like eating sand? <laughs> about 24 hours, your whole land will be turned to sand. How about that? And don't you even think about coming over here trying to wage war with us. There will be hailstorms, tornadoes, earthquakes all in your vicinity. Simple as that. And that is running the earth in righteousness. All right? You will according to scripture have some you know rebellious ones yeah. and they're going to be taught a lesson and uh, yeah the power is going to be cut off as I said before and they're going to regret it and then they're going to change and they're going to come back as simple as that alright that was a good question very very good question all people are going to be a part of this kingdom that is to come anything else nothing else out there alright one last question Shalom priest Shalom um, in Micah 4, um, 
one through five is that also pertaining to the city of adam all right we'll get somebody to get it what was that micah four Mm -hmm. Micah 4, 1 through 5. But in the last days it shall come to pass that the mountain of the house of the Heavenly Father shall be established in the top of the mountains, and it shall be exalted above all the hills, and the people shall flow unto it. And many nations shall come and say, Come and let us go to the mountain of the Heavenly Father, and to the house of the God or the power of Jacob. And he will teach us his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For the law shall go forth out of Zion, and the word of the Heavenly Father from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among many people and rebuke strong nations afar off. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into proning hooks. Nations shall not lift up a sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. But they shall sit every man under the vine and under his fig tree, and none shall make them afraid. And the mouth of the heavenly Father of hosts has spoken it. All right, that's it. Absolutely right on point. Everybody shall turn their weapons of war to weapons of agriculture. Nations shall not learn war anymore. There's not going to be nukes, Ukraine, World War I, II, any of that. Once again, they shall rebuke the strong nations. How are they going to do it? Once again, that power that the Most High has given them. And every nation shall come to Jerusalem, come to the navel of the earth. They're going to be there in the navel of the earth, worshiping, praising the Most High. What are you bringing your tights? Corn, oil, and wine for to dump it off and leave? No, you have to heave that to the Heavenly Father. Mm. And so you're going to be right there with the priests. And there's going to be a right established. Baptism, anointing, passing over those tithes to the priests, heaving them on behalf of that entire nation, and reaping the blessing, taking it back to your nation. Taking that power and taking that energy. Right on point. That is of the Most High, and that's what's coming. So everybody watching or hearing these brothers talking about who head we're going to be cutting off yeah. and who we're going to be running over and who we're going to stab, who we raping and all, you don't know righteousness. That's not how angels behave themselves, mm. all right? Brutes and beastly men, earthly men behave that way, all right? When you can cut the power off and they behave themselves, why, why go over there and do all that? Mm. I want to mess up my, my, my garment made out of electricity. Get some blood on it. Huh? So this is what's coming to the earth. Let's prepare ourselves. The exodus, once again, has already begun. It started right now. The most I put the seeds in our mind, and it ain't going nowhere. Anybody who want to exit this place, leave and exodus this evil place that we've been sojourning in for quite some time, the Most High is now hearing your cries and supplication. He's going around putting the mark in everybody who sigh and cry for all the abominations that be done. The mark, the covenant in your head, circumcising your consciousness, getting you ripe and ready for a grand exodus out of this place. We're going to end it on that. We are in the Feast of Harvest, or the Feast of Ingathering, the Feast of Weeks, what they call Pentecost. So let us Feast because the Most High have come down with cloven tongues and have given us a gift in this last day. Let us, like the apostles and saints of old, take hold of it and utilize it for our liberation. Peace and blessings be multiplied amongst the saints. Shalom. Shalom.